All persons having business before the Honorable Associate Judges, now presiding over the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, draw near and give your attention. God save this United States and it's on the court. This on the court is now in session. Please come to order. Good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, virtually to the District of Columbia Court of Appeals. Uh, we have three arguments on this morning's calendar. I wanna mention two things before we get started. Uh, the first of them is that we have uh, this morning sitting with us by designation for the first two cases, uh, Judge Henry Green from the Superior Court. So we appreciate his, uh, uh, his service with us. And uh, the second is that we will take a, a brief break after the first two arguments to reconstitute the division and uh, Judge Green will be replaced by Judge uh, Thompson. Uh, with that said, we'll call the first case, uh, which is uh, Bravon Freeman versus the United States, uh, number 19 CF 964. Uh, Mr. Hart, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. I place the court. My name is Dennis Hart. I'm here to ask the court to consider today the case of Brazon Freeman. Uh, the central issue is a philosophical one. That is, what is the meaning of lane and what is the meaning of line? When I first uh, briefed this case and submitted to the court, I, I felt it was a unique niche question that was very arcane and would probably only apply to this case. Thanks to a review of the government's response, I, know now, I now know that this has become a significant issue, which I'll, perhaps I'll explain a little further in the argument. And um, I mentioned that because I now believe this, our, this case has some significant ramifications. And I no longer think of it as arcane. I was surprised to learn, for example, that people write law review articles about just this question. Um, they're called, often called fog lane cases, and they've generated a number of law reviews because of the, the belief that they serve as a cover for pretext searches. Thus, the definition of lane and the definition of line has become very critical in Fourth Amendment law. Um, <clears throat> Because the Supreme Court has expanded greatly the ability of police to stop automobiles for uh, traffic or other violations, uh, there remains one other check on police activity, and that is the reasonableness of their articulable suspicion. In this case, the articulable suspicion was that the driver of this car, not Mr. Freeman, but the driver had um, had uh, left his lane. And the evidentiary basis for this is that he had touched the line separating the two travel lanes, not the line dividing opposite traffic, but the, the, the lane uh, next to him, which was a dotted line. Or, uh, and he touched it with his tires twice and the police officers found that to be uh, traveling outside of his lane, stopped him and then found the, the contraband which was later uh, used as evidence against him and to which he pled guilty. Uh, there, there was not, oh, just, just remind me, there was, there was not testimony that he say crossed the middle part of the dividing line, right? I don't believe so, Your Honor. And remind me what the testimony was for how long he might have put those lines. I'm not certain. There was a time estimate. It was twice, but it was twice. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah, it, Can I ask Mr. Martin? You're referring in the singular to the dividing line. But if your theory is right, isn't it that there are two different overlapping dividing lines, and that the, the what divides the two lanes? are on the one hand, if you're talking about the, the, you know, the rightmost lane, it's the far side of the, uh, you know, the white dotted line or, or I don't, a rectangle, if you want to be more geometrically precise, I guess. Um, and if you're in the left lane, what divides where you're allowed to go or what is the limit of where you're allowed to go and still be in your lane is the right side of that white uh, rectangle. So they're really, if on your view, aren't there two different dividing, you know, two different end lines for each lane, 
uh, you know, one of them on, you know, the, the, the distant side of that white rectangle. Is that fair? Or you think that's yes, not yes, right? Yes, I think that's fair. Uh, and that's what some courts call the fog line. That is the line that divides the roadway from the shoulder versus the No, I, I'm, I'm talking now about the, I'm talking now about the rectangular uh, uh, intermittent uh, 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 white rectangles that are dividing two lanes going in the same direction where passing is permitted. The fog lane, yeah. I thought, from what I, I you know, from what I've learned, and I could easily uh, be foggy about this, uh, I thought that the fog line was a somewhat not intuitive label for the 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 line uh, in, in America, I guess, on the right side as you're traveling that the, the, the divides the part of the roadway you're allowed to regularly travel on from the shoulder where you're not normally allowed to travel, uh, but you you know sometimes have to pull over. Um, but my question is about, again, the, the, the intermittent white rectangles that are uh, you know part of uh, demarking in whatever way you think is the right way to describe it, the two different lanes that you can travel in the same direction. And my question is just, I just wanna make sure you agree what seems to me true, which is if your theory is right, there isn't uh, a, uh, a single line that divides those two lanes. There are two different lines that demark the, you know, that the demarcate the, the, the far extent of each of those two lanes. And then there's an overlapping stripe in the middle that is within each of the two lanes. Is that, is that a correct description of the logical uh, analysis of your position? Yes, I, I, I agree with, with everything the court describes. I, I would add that in my review of the cases, the middle dotted line is often referred to by courts as the same as the right shoulder line or the fog line, which is different, of course, from the, the, the dividing between the opposing traffic on the other left hands. So there is a difference between the lines. And there was a difference in this case. Well, I'm not certain there was a fog line in this case, but there, there is a difference that some courts call a permissible line. That is the middle dotted line is sometimes called a permissible line, whereas the right-hand fog line is called a prohibited line. And that, that factors in some decisions about whether you can touch it or cross it or go over it and still be within the law. You are not, Mr. sorry, Judge Green. Mr. Hart, let me ask you, you said two definitions are important here. What is the meaning of lane and what is the meaning of line? Uh, I'm concerned about the definition of what is the meaning of entirely because the statute here, the statute, excuse me, the regulation requires that cars be driven nearly as practicable entirely within a single lane of travel. Uh, can, is a car entirely within a single lane of travel when it's on the line between the lanes of travel? If I were the government, I would say no. In my <laughs> position, I would say yes. And uh, for support, I would point to the cases that we've cited in our brief, as well as one which the government cites, in which touching is still considered within the lane. Now, I agree that the government has mentioned a number of cases which say that if you touch, you are outside of your lane, but they are not the majority. I know the court's not going to count the number on one side on the other and make a decision based on numbers. That's why we, uh, we referred to the court to not all the cases that consider the lines, but the ones that are most helpful. And reading the government's brief, I would add one other case that we think explains the situation. Uh, and that's the Ohio case. Uh, I think it's called Turner. Um, the Turner case which was decided by the Supreme Court of Ohio considered that question of whether- well, that, that, that was an outside, what Judge McLeish referred to as a fog line, right? It separated yes. the roadway from the divider. And there's at least an argument that the oddity that the government posits, and I think Judge McLeish was hinting at, that if it's a dividing line, it would have to sort of be fair game for two different lanes of travel if we adopt your interpretation that entering it is not a lane violation. That oddity doesn't exist if we're just talking about dividing the roadway from the shoulder because that line only restricts one lane of travel. Is that, are you following me there? I am, and I, I agree with that. Okay. And, and can you just tell me what, 
is it Warfield? Is it Gross? Do you have a case that you think makes the best case for why that dividing line is um, fair game? That 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 it, that's that touching it is not a lane violation. Is Turner? I mean, because Turner is the outside line. Um, oh, I, I see what you mean. Yes, and um, some of them, like Gross, Gross actually says you can cross the line um, so long as it's briefly, because the practicability standard in the regulation suggests it's not to be so strictly enforced. And you don't really make an argument like that, do you? No, uh, I think Gross is, a, is, is an example of why a court refuses to make a bright line about crossing the line. And I think that was the RV uh, going up the mountain and subject to high winds. Um, I, I should add that in this case, there was no claim that the driver in this case uh, if he was viewed as changing the lanes, did so uh, unsafely, that he endangered other traffic, which is one of the elements that many of the cases consider as an element of, of whether there is, is reasonable articulable suspicion to stop. Uh, for instance, the, the Maryland case that we cited uses that as a test. Uh, the government is correct that it has been cited for including that as part of the test, but that is part of the statute. That but are, are you, uh, a related question to the question Judge Shield just asked you, but are, are you arguing that it doesn't matter, uh, even assuming that um, the car your client was in was not entirely within a single lane, that wasn't a traffic violation unless there was a, a danger? Yes. You are arguing that? Yes. Um, and how, how would you fit that into the word the wording of um, the, the TCMR provision 22016A? Uh, it, it, it has, it, it seems to have two halves. Number one, as far as practicable, stay entirely within a lane. Number two, don't move from that lane unless it's safe. Um, uh, so it, it, are you saying that the second you can't violate the first prohibition unless you do it in an unsafe way and therefore have kind of violated the second part of the, the regulation? Yes, Your Honor, I am. So uh, your position is uh, as long if it's in the middle of the night and nobody else is around and I'm driving on a, a road that has two road, you know, two lanes traveling in the same direction separated by these intermittent white uh, uh, rectangles, if I want to, I can just go ahead and drive right down the, you know, have the, my, the, my hood ornament lined up on the, on the dotted white rectangles and just drive like that indefinitely. That, uh, is that, that's your position of what the reg uh, uh, permits? No, not, not exactly. Uh, that's a hypothetical taken to an extreme. I would say that it's, it's not a violation if you change lanes and there is no danger to other traffic. Well, there's a separate regulation, and that, I think that's right as far as it goes with changing lanes without signaling, at least. Um, uh, well, in order to change lanes, you have to leave your travel lane. Understood. Um, but I, I'm a little unsure. You, you seem to say, no, the reg does preclude indefinitely driving down, you know, with your hood ornament lined up with the, 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 the intermittent white rectangles. Um, but it's okay if you, I'm not quite sure, you know, if you, uh, well, let me ask you, uh, let me just see where you draw the lines, no pun intended. So uh, uh, imagine what had happened here instead was nobody was around, no safety issue, but without signaling, there had been, you know, a drifting over so that, you know, the car, uh, you know, indisputably the tire was, you know, one of the, the left tire was entirely uh, into, the left travel lane and then, you know, kind of swerved or veered back and that did that several times. Would you say a violation of this regulation or not a violation? I, I would say no violation unless there is demonstration that it was a safety hazard. Mr. Hart, let me ask you, we're, we're sitting here and it took you some time to answer that question with the benefit of being able to sit and reflect on it. Uh, is it your position that the officer's belief where it's late at night, it's 11 o'clock, uh, he sees this car swerve once to the left and land on the line and go back. And then moments later, he sees it swerve again. And he concludes 
from that, there, there was an infraction and he has a basis to stop the car because he's concerned about the possible uh, possibility the, the, dry, the driver is impaired. Uh, is, is that unreasonable conduct on the part of the officer in your judgment? In, in this case, I believe it is. Uh, I don't Why? say that's a general rule for all cases because it would depend on what the officer describes as swerving. I think swerve was used, but when you can use veered the, and swerved. I'm sorry, Aaron. I think both words were used once swerve and once veered. Yes. Uh, I believe policemen are taught to use those words. The facts may be different. Unfortunately, we don't have a dash cam for this case. And the description of touching the lines to me reflects not a veer or a swerve, but a wander. And that's different from impairment. I mean, for, for, for all we know, he was hugging the line at every other moment. And the veer consisted of, you know, a three inch movement to the left, sort of that is quite routine when driving a car, right? Yes, I agree, Your Honor. I see that my time is up. We would respectfully submit to the court. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hart. We'll give you a very brief time in rebuttal if you would like it. Uh, thank we'll you. hear now from uh, Mr. Nessler. May it please the court, Jeff Nessler on behalf of the United States. Your honors, in this case, the officer's actions were objectively reasonable when they twice observed the car in which Mr. Freeman was a passenger swerve or veer, both words were used as Judge Green indicated, to the left uh, on two successive blocks. And uh, it's important to note that the, the officers and Judge Smith did not use the word wander or drift uh, or attempt to change lanes. This was the car swerved and then corrected. Then it drove another block and it well, swerved you're, you're, and corrected. You're suggesting that uh, there must be some difference between veering, swer among veering, swerving, and drifting, or uh, I forget what the fourth option was. Wandering. Wandering, yes. Uh, and you could pick some others too. Um, but unless someone tells us something more concrete, it's a little hard to know exactly what was meant by an officer's selection of any one of those four words. Yes, Judge, the government would submit that a swerve or veer uh, is more severe than a, a wander or a drift. And, and there's a, um, a reasonableness to that because the officer said that the car corrected. So a swerve and a correct, and then another swerve and a correct would indicate as the officers testified, a distracted or potentially impaired driver. Uh, a, a wandering of a car might uh, have, or a drifting of a car might have a different interpretation for the officers about what was going on with the driver uh, or the vehicle. Uh, it, in this case, it was it was late at night, and there was, it was a, it's a heavily trafficked road, uh, obviously here on North Capitol. And so the, the swerving and correcting would indicate to the officers that something more uh, nefarious or more dangerous was afoot, I should say, not nefarious, but dangerous, which is why the officers decided to affect the traffic stop uh, in this case, as they testified to. Uh, and because the officers had two uh, independent but related uh, reasons for affecting the traffic stop, both to investigate the potential impairment or DUI and also to investigate the failure to maintain a lane, the traffic stop was itself reasonable. And, and I respectfully disagree with Mr. Hart about whether this is a philosophical question about the meaning of lanes and the meaning of lines. This is actually a very straightforward case about what is reasonable uh, because the, the touchstone of the Fourth Amendment is reasonableness. And so the question for this court well, is- Well, a little bit depends, I guess, on whether you are hoping that we will rule for you under Hyen and Campbell and mistake of law, in which case maybe we don't need to know the answer to you know the somewhat theoretical question or practical here question of what a lane is. Um, but if you uh, are hoping that we will rule for you on the ground that the officer's conduct was lawful relative to this particular infraction, I think we will have to figure out the question uh, of, of what is a lane uh, within the meaning of this regulation? Um, and uh, why isn't it uh, some evidence of the potential ambiguity of that term that courts around the country seem to reach different conclusions about what it means where it isn't uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, explicitly unambiguously defined? There, there is, of course, some ambiguity by definition, as your honor indicated, based on the fact that some courts have ruled in, in different ways. I'll, I'll, there's a couple of responses to that though, uh, your honor. One is that most of the cases going the other way involve fog lines. 
as Judge Deal had just been indicating when questioning Mr. Hart, the fog line, uh, for whatever reason, has developed a, its own uh, set of case law because the right side of the lane is not uh, defined by the fog line, according to many courts. Uh, but we're not dealing with that here. We're dealing with the line on the left side of the car, uh, which separates one lane. This uh, officer testified that would be lane one going south on North Capitol. And then lane two would be the lane adjacent to that. Also, Although, although there's south. nothing in the regulations suggesting that the lines are, are different, right? If, if, if you're right that to be with entirely within a lane is to be entirely within the lines, um, I think you'd have to say, well, those courts that say the fog line is within the lane are just wrong. I mean, I take that to be your principal argument. Maybe, maybe this is a fallback for you. I'm, I'm just curious if, if that is what you think. It, it is a fallback, Your Honor, but I, I respectfully disagree that there is nothing in the regulation uh, distinguishing the fog line from other lines because the prefatory clause for the regulation says that whenever a roadway has been divided into two or more clearly marked lanes for travel, and so it's certainly possible to have a road uh, that has been marked without having a fog line that is marked. In other words, that the fog line is not essential to the regulation. Whether a fog line exists doesn't mean or doesn't make it uh, necessary for this uh, regulation to apply. You, you mean, well, I mean, most, almost always, I guess the only time there would, the prefatory language wouldn't apply would be in a one-way street um, because then, uh, I guess this definition just wouldn't be applicable, but for even a two-way street that has one lane in each direction, the, this preface applies, right? It, it would apply, but there's no, there's no uh, necessarily, a, a fog line is not required in order to make a lane. In other words, the, the, the dividing line between two lanes is required to make it a lane. And that's what this regulation is talking about. A fog line is not. I, 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 I guess you've lost me a little bit, but and I'm just going from an intuition of what the word lane would mean. I generally think of a lane as a uh, uh, an area bounded on both sides. And so, if I were, you know, if I came across a big uh, stretch of unpaved dirt, uh, and there was a line that just kind of divided it in half. Uh, I'm not sure I'd know what to do, but I wouldn't necessarily think anybody had given me any lanes to travel on. Correct. So, so I, I, I kind of think that, again, uh, 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 I, I tend to think that implicit in the idea of lane, at least, but this is just off the top of my head, I have to say, because I haven't really looked into it, but I would have thought implicit in the idea of a lane is that there is a boundary on both sides that defines the lane rather than simply a division of a space into two halves by some kind of a line or, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, because they're curved, not always lines in a strictly geometrical term. It, it, that is possible based on our common sense of driving your honor and knowledge of, of the streets and lane markings. But the way the regulation is written, it's focused on the dividing between the lanes. That's why it talks about when a roadway has been divided into two or more clearly marked lanes for traffic. And so it doesn't talk about when a road is divided with a fog line dividing a lane from the so curve. am i right in understanding is your point that if a, if it, let's say there's a two-way uh, uh or let's say there's a one-way road a one-way street and it's got you know lines on both sides are you saying that if somebody starts driving you know with the hood ornament lined up on the right of those two lines and the wheels the rest of the way off you would say that's not a violation of this regulation because uh there's no lane for this regulation itself, the lane, the roadway has not been divided into two or more clearly marked lanes. I mean, th that is an essential part of this statute. I mean, there are certainly other reasons why the officers might want to affect a traffic stop on someone doing that under your honor's hypothetical, but the failure to maintain a lane regulation might not be the most applicable there because it, the lane has not been, the, has, the roadway has not been clearly divided into two or more clearly marked lanes. But going back to uh, the, the earlier point about uh, fog lines versus other lanes, so many of those other cases do discuss fog lines, and including uh, the government filed the letter last week after um, recognizing the, the Ohio Supreme Court Turner decision. That was also a fog line case. Um, and so while well, the intermediate appellate court had just talked in sort of broad terms about lines and, and lanes and lines, the Ohio Supreme Court was very clear this was a fog line case. Uh, and so when we're talking about actual cases where a car is drifting to its left, if there's two lanes in the same, uh, going the same direction, like there were here, 
and the car goes to its left like it does here and the car drives on top of the dotted or uh, intermediate spaced rectangles as, as Judge McLeese indicated. Um, at that point, the car is no longer entirely within its lane it, because that space is not entirely within either lane. Uh, if it were, then two cars could be side by side driving the same rate of travel, the same direction and both be within the same lane, which would not I mean, be there, are, there are a hundred regulations that prevent that from happening, right? You don't pass in the same direction unless you can do so from a safe distance, right? So, I mean, I don't find it so awkward that that line could be shared by two different lanes when we have a lot of redundancies that prevent sort of the bizarre scenario that you posit. That's correct, but we're going to the interpretation of, of how this should be interpreted and the way that the drafters of the statute or the regulation wrote it were to say entirely within the lane. And well, so, you, would, you know, let, let's, 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 because you cite to some track regulations, let's test your knowledge of sports. Uh, in baseball, if the ball is entirely within the field of play, do you know if it's in or out, if it's on the line? It would be in, Your Honor. It would be in. Uh, in soccer, do you know the answer to that? Uh, in, in soccer, the ball would be in. It, it would be in. What about tennis? Do you know about tennis? Yes, Your Honor. Volleyball? That one I'm not familiar with, but I assume it's, the answer it's in. is the same. I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> there's a theme. And, and I also say that in soccer, at least some of the intermediate lines, you know, the line that marks the box where the goalie has to stay within if he's holding the ball, the ball needs to be entirely over the line going in one direction or the other to be inside or outside of the box, depending on which way you're coming from. So... I take your point. It's a little weird, but you know, there are sports, you know, you, you cite to track and I can think of some other football. If you touch the line, you're out basketball. If you touch the line, you're out. Uh, it strikes me as the type of thing that if you were going to seriously regulate, you would make it clear. And I think one thing that has not been done is it's not so clear from the regulations and, and that, you know, do you, do, you, do you find it so clear because of the word, use of the word entirely? Yes, it, it is clear. Entirely within means entirely within. It doesn't uh, take- No, the, but it says entirely within the lane and whether or not that line is part of the lane or not is not clear. It, to, to say that it is, is just sort of circular to me. So it, the, in terms of the sports analogies, Your Honor, and I, and I, I take your point, which is why we cited to the, the track and I, would, and I haven't looked at the swimming, but it, it, the same idea would apply when you have multiple competitors traveling in the same direction at what one would assume around the same rate of speed. That's when we're concerned about crashes, about infractions, about interactions. And that's why we want to keep people separated or keep the competitors separated. Um, it's different than a ball or a player on, on opposite sides of the field in, in tennis or in, in baseball which is why the track is, is most uh, appropriate here. Two runners running alongside each other, they need to stay within their own lanes. If they go- but, I mean, it's, on, it's quite interesting that they say explicitly in the rules that stepping on the line is a violation, presumably because that seems like the type of thing you might wanna specify because otherwise it seems pretty ambiguous. That, that is also possible. And, and the NCA regs, I think were written more recently than this 1930 regulation uh, from the Uniform uh, Motor Vehicle Code. Th that being said, this is the, the language we have and, and the interpretation that the officers here gave it that the car was not entirely within the lane is perfectly reasonable. Uh, uh, under Hine, or if we don't even need to get to Hine, that is of course is our fallback position. But Mr. Nessler, yes. Mr. Nessler, let me ask you, can we resolve this case uh, in your favor without resolving the question that you uh, and Judge Deal have been uh, arguing over the last five minutes? Yes, Your Honor. How? This, court, this court can decide the case narrowly, which is that the officer's actions in affecting the traffic stop on the car in which Mr. Freeman was a passenger were reasonable. And that ends the, the discussion that, that solves the Fourth Amendment issue. Um, and I'll, I'll point out Mr. Hart did not mention the Fifth Amendment issue and, and I won't delve into that uh, during my time unless the court has additional questions on the Fifth Amendment issue. But I believe that would resolve the case, Judge Green. Thank you. And so it, it, unless there are any further questions from the court, the government would submit the officer's actions here were reasonable and therefore the Mr. Freeman and the, the driver of the car uh, were lawfully stopped as a part of a Terry stop uh, to investigate what either DUI and or failure to maintain a lane 
and therefore the officer's actions were reasonable under the Fourth Amendment, and the gun should not be suppressed. Do you have any reaction to the argument, which I'm not so sure is preserved, but uh, Appellant seems to make now, that the word practicable in the regulation does some work for his That is, uh, it suggests a brief clipping of the line should not be so strictly enforced as a constitutive violation when the statute does not say, if at all possible, stay within the lines. It says to the extent practicable, which seems pretty loosey goosey to me. You know, if it's not a, a pretty serious breach of that, it shouldn't be considered a violation of the regulation. Do you have a reaction to that? There are situations, Your Honor, and I think we included them in a footnote in our brief based partially on the Tennessee Supreme Court's decision in Smith on what practical would mean if, if uh, the officers had seen a deer run into the road or an oil slick or some other, or it was windy or mountainous or the car was an RV and it barely stayed within the lane itself. There are a whole host of situations in which driving as nearly as practicable within a lane would mean to the officers uh, under their, their intuition, their training, their observations that perhaps an infraction has not occurred and they did not have reasonable suspicion to affect a traffic stop. Uh, if they were to observe those things. Uh, it, it's, it's all sorts of things are possible. I think that the, the Smith court had sort of pointed out the, the HOV violation, Your Honor, which is an officer sees a person driving themselves uh, in a high occupancy lane uh, and affects a traffic stop only to get closer and realize there's two children slumped over in the back seat. Uh, it, the officer's effect of the traffic stop is not unreasonable simply because at the time the officer didn't have all of those facts now uh, known to him. All right, thank you, Mr. Nessler. Uh, we will give Mr. Hart a minute or two in rebuttal if he uh, would like. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, there, there are two points that I would wish to make. Uh, first, I'd like to put in a plug for the Turner case. I think it's the most recent case, the Supreme Court of Ohio case. It's the most recent case and the most comprehensive. True, it is a, a crossover case rather than a touch. But my reading of, of most of the cases is that most of the courts consider those two different lines to be equivalent as far as uh, uh, articulable suspicion to stop. Uh, the second thing is, uh, because of this case, uh, involuntarily, I have noticed traffic as I drive in, and I've noticed that there is a whole lot of touching going on on our roads. And I say this because it is one of the responsibilities of this court to limit the police activity that is based on this sort of observation. The touching of traffic lines, no matter where they are, is a common occurrence. And uh, a ruling in favor of the government in this case gives the police almost carte blanche uh, to stop and conduct further investigations. And we urge the court not do that. How much uh, speeding have you observed as you drive around? A fair amount. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nessler. We appreciate your briefs and your arguments here today, and the case is submitted. Thank you. All right, we will call uh, the second case, which is uh, PHDC1 LLC et al. versus Evans and Joyce Willoughby Trust, number 20 CV302. Uh, we'll hear first from uh, Ms. Besunder. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Allison Arden Besunder, and I represent the appellants in this case, who I will refer to collectively as PHC. Um, I am respectfully asking this court to vacate the judgment against my clients and dismiss the appellee's the landlord's claims below in their entirety. Um, and I would like to reserve a few minutes for rebuttal. I, I think two or three minutes should be sufficient. Your honors, it is tempting to view this case as a cookie cutter commercial lease. It is not as open and shut as the appellees would have this co lower court and the, this court believe. And on closer, excuse me, on closer inspection of the lease and of the pleadings and of the entire history and circumstances here, the cards begin to crumble. And I will quote the Surrett Court, which was cited by the lower court in its decision. This is not a straightforward case. This case, the one that was before the Superior Court that is appealed, 
was a lawsuit on the guarantee for, quote, all sums due and owing under the lease. There are no sums due and owing under the lease. The appellees, the landlord, made an admission that there are no sums due and owing under the lease when it asserted a claim for back rent in the landlord-tenant action, elected its remedies, and entered a consent judgment for possession only, thereby relinquishing its claim for back rent and conceding that there are no sums due and owing under the lease. Ms. Senator, can I ask you about that? I mean, I think under ordinary circumstances, what you say would have a lot of force, but we're in a funny context where uh, there is claim splitting that we don't ordinarily permit that is recognized and contemplated uh, so that ordinarily, if you are, you know, if you had an action and you were trying to get some equitable relief and trying to get some monetary relief and you filed an action seeking only one of them and didn't seek the other, and then later tried to get monetary relief, you would have uh, split your claims and you'd be barred by uh, res judicata uh, uh, claim preclusion type principles. Um, but in the, the, the landlord tenant court is designed uh, differently and it's intended to permit some kind of claim splitting. And uh, the issue I guess here is whether the claim splitting that happened here is kind of within the permissible contemplated claim splitting or something different. And um, when you characterize what was done as an admission, uh, that, that, that you start losing me a little. Uh, it seemed for sure the tenant, uh, uh, the landlord originally sought money, money damages and uh, possession. Um, and then the parties were able to work out an agreement about possession. Uh, and it seemed like they were still fighting about the money damages. There was an effort to put in the settlement agreement, uh, you know, something that expressly said the, the landlord could go get them. That wasn't approved. There's nothing that says the landlord is giving them up. Uh, in the settlement agreement. So it seemed as though what it really was, was an agreement by the parties to resolve the possession matter and then to fight another day in another court about whether uh, money damages were or were not available. Uh, so I don't so much see it as, uh, it doesn't leap out to me as an admission rather than sort of a, a partial resolution and a kicking of the can down the road for the rest of the fight. So let me address that. So I agree with, Actually, 99% of that, um, I would just point out a couple of things. So here, in this case, it is both. It is both the admission. It is also, you could call it subject matter jurisdiction, re judicata, mootness, um, estoppel. Um, the admission is the estoppel. Right there was a there's a claim preclusion against the landlord, so it is it's not either or it is both and, um, and here a little bit different than those other cases right so the cases that are cited actually support what we're saying here and a lot of those cases that are cited either by the court or the landlord either below or here that the landlord in one case um, in landlord tenant court sought possession only. And that is, that is true, I agree with you. Landlord tenant court is for summary possession and to speed things along. But in, I believe it was the Paragon case, the landlord sought possession only, sought later to amend a claim for back rent. And the court said, no, you can't amend. You can now go in superior court. That is not the case here. The landlord sought the back rent. So that's number one. Number two, at best, it's an issue of fact that the court should have said there is an issue of fact warranting a trial because the circumstances and the conduct of these parties who, by the way, were such good friends that my client went to Chris Willoughby's wedding. Um, the, the context of their conduct, the context of what was going on was that my clients understood the giving back of the possession to be done with it. And there are facts. Can I ask you, uh, on, uh, did you ask for some kind of a hearing and argue that the uh, race judicata issue was a question of fact that needed to be resolved after an evidentiary hearing in the trial court or in this court up well, to now? I would, I would submit that on the opposition to the summary judgment and the record as a whole indicates that, first of all, it was raised because my client's attorney below, which was not me, did raise a motion to dismiss for race judicata claim preclusion and collateral estoppel. That motion was denied. Um, the case proceeded to discovery. But, but I, I think your answer is there was no request for an evidentiary hearing on the basis that that was a question of fact, which, which it, to my knowledge, never is. Um, I, I've, I've not come across a case where race judicata turned on a question of fact. Right. I, and I, I, I'm, in, in all honesty, I'm not sure if it was expressly phrased or articulated that way. It probably was not. 
Um, I am saying it here to point out that on the record as a whole, that at best, right, I, I am saying that it, it's the, the first line of attack is that the landlords are stopped from, from now taking a second crack at the apple when they have conceded that the liability of the tenant is zero. Right? Can I ask you a hypothetical? So imagine, because I take your point that some of the cases, unlike this case, uh, are ones where there was never a request in the landlord tenant court for money damage. So this is different from that, for sure. Um, now, not all of them, the Sintolis case, which your opponent relies upon, doesn't seem more complex uh, uh, than that. But so imagine that what had happened here was that the landlord had originally sought both money damages and possession. And that um, uh, the, um, uh, there came a time when the parties could agree about possession and the landlord filed a motion which said, you know, I, the parties have reached an agreement about possession and we would like to voluntarily dismiss without prejudice our money damages claim. And imagine that the, uh, uh, your client hadn't objected and the trial court entered a voluntary dismissal. Uh, would you think that that uh, sequence of events would create a race judicata bar if the uh, landlord then went and as happened here, initiated a, uh, a request in the civil branch, if that's the right uh, 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 label uh, uh, for money damages. If I understand the question correctly and I just wanna rephrase it so I'm sure. You are asking whether a voluntary dismissal would be distinct from a consent judgment, which is the case here, correct? Well, no, I'm asking if, if um, there was a consent judgment as it related to, so, so in other words, what happens is the, the, the um, uh, landlord comes in and says, here's a partial consent judgment. Everybody agrees about possession. There, are, there is this outstanding money damages request. I ask you judge to volunteer, you know, I, I'm voluntarily dismissing that. That would be different. The trial court granted the motion. So it's a partial consent as to possession and voluntary uh, dismissal without prejudice for the money damages. On that hypothetical, I would agree with you 100%. Here, however, the consent judgment is an adjudication of the entirety of the action and all claims. And the case was then marked as closed. There was no reservation. And what my point to you about the issue of fact- was oh, so, so, Can I just ask a question? You say there was no reservation, but the general rule is if the judgment doesn't specify um, it is that you know, claims are dismissed without prejudice and not with prejudice. Um, so was there anything in, when, the, when the landlord tenant case resolved itself via the settlement agreement, um, was there anything in the trial court's sort of final statement saying that and the remaining claims for monetary damages are dismissed with prejudice? Was there, was there anything, I, I think the answer is no, that there wasn't any suggestion about those claims being resolved, yay or nay. Uh, is so that right? In, you mean in the, in the landlord-tenant court, not in the yeah. landlord court. I, I would assume that you are correct. The, the landlord-tenant court being the summary proceeding venue that it is, um, I don't, but I will point out that the landlord did seek, seek to have money damages assessed and they could not meet their evidentiary burden. And that is reflected in the docket. So in effect- they Why do you say they couldn't meet their evidentiary burden? I mean, the they didn't actually prevail. And I thought the parties, the, I haven't gone back to check these, but the parties I think say, that the docket entries in the landlord tenant matter simply reflect after the consent agreement, just say closed uh, and that there isn't anything further. Is that consistent with your belief no, or no, do you have a different if, belief? If you go, if you, and if I apologize, I don't know the record reference right off the top of my head, but in the landlord tenant action, there is there are two entries. It is on A15 in the record. And on May 24th, this was before the, the, the default was vacated. And even on the default, the landlord came in and made an oral motion for money judgment. So they made that motion. And then uh, three entries down about um, 5-24-2018 that the order denying oral motion for money judgment was entered. And I, I don't have the citation with me, but I believe that I'd seen somewhere along the line that the judge, um, the, the landlord tenant court um, had denied that for um, failure to meet the evidentiary burden, even on the default. So I, I would say that in response to- I'm sorry, but that, that so- mm -hmm. uh, what, It looked to me like what happened, and I, I have gone back to look at the underlying orders. There, we could take judicial notice of them, I assume, so we can see them. I assume no one would object to our looking at them, but uh, it looks as though there was originally a default 
and then the default got vacated because there was a, maybe it was going to be like a, a kind of an ex parte proof hearing and the trial court said you know you've come in here on this default and you're trying to you know uh, establish damages and i'm not going to give you that and i'm going to vacate the default and we're going to go on to the merits um, and then there was further litigation about whether there was going to be money damages it wasn't like money damages were then treated as out of the, the case or am i misunderstanding it so you think that meant you know that there was never any further litigation about the possibility of money damages so if you look at the entry um, above the one that says order denying oral motion for money judgment there is a note in the docket that says Mr. LaFon was present for plaintiff, plaintiff present only. So that's true. There was a default, but plaintiff's request for an oral judgment is denied as plaintiff failed to provide a ledger. So they were given an opportunity to prove their damages, could not meet their burden. And then it was resolved by consent judgment. So I would submit that this case is different. Um, and to Judge Deal's question about there being a presumption about it being without prejudice, except that here they, they produced evidence and it was denied and they had an opportunity to meet their burden they did not and it was ultimately resolved in a judgment that resolved all of the claims um and and so i, I would submit that this case is different the circumstances of this case are unique and different and given the fact that it's landlord tenant court and the idea is to get them moving as quickly as possible um was you know, it, I wasn't part of your position in the landlord tenant court that your clients were no longer in possession of the property and therefore the claims for money judgment weren't properly before the landlord tenant court? That was one of the arguments that Mr. Nawash, their prior counsel made, yes. So, so why wouldn't we read the trial court's disposition saying, okay, possession's been settled by the parties, this case is dismissed. Why wouldn't we read it in light of that position that once possession's been settled, nothing further for the landlord tenant court to do? As you had argued that, that you, that was your position. Right. So there were also other arguments. And again, it's not the record below is not uh, the procedural pieces of it aren't clean. They had also there were also objections as to jurisdiction. That motion, I believe, was denied. There were um, and, and you're you're correct that that motion was made by Mr. Nawash. And what I how I read the docket of the landlord tenant court is that the plaintiff landlord sought to damages, put in an evidentiary record, which was which they didn't meet their burden of proof. Mr. Nawash, on behalf of my clients, did make certain arguments about jurisdiction. And ultimately, the entirety of all claims that were raised, that were litigated, that had an opportunity to be litigated, were resolved in a judgment, which is a, it's an adjudication on the merits, as opposed to Judge McLeese's hypothetical about um, a partial judgment and a partial voluntary dismissal. The voluntary dismissal part would not be an adjudication on the merits. Here in the land or tenant court um, in a summary proceeding forum. There was, this was a, a trial on the merits, an evidentiary hearing on the merits as to the back rent. And then in combination with the fact that the landlord is effectively conceded, it's as if the judgment said zero rent is owed by the tenant. And if zero rent is owed by the tenant, then they can't go after the guarantor for more than zero. Okay, oh, well, um... Can I ask you about the guarantors? Because your opponent argues, and I, I'm not sure I saw a, a detailed response to this, but your opponent argues that the guarantee agreement itself says that the ability of the um, uh, uh, landlord to go against the guarantors, uh, this is a paraphrase, but it's sort of unaffected by whatever relief is, is sought as against the, uh, the um, uh, tenant. Not as to a judgment. And I agree, and that's what I that's what I alluded to when I said that this is not a cookie cutter case because the guarantee has two parts. One of them is that the, the landlord was entitled to go after the guarantor for more, but they relinquished that. They didn't ask for that in summary judgment um, because they acknowledged there was an issue of fact as to whether or not they had mitigated damages. And here, what it says is that if they don't pursue the tenant, if they um, if they compromise it, if they don't, you know, they haven't waived that right. But here, and it doesn't say that in the text of the guarantee or the lease. This was a judgment, an adjudication on the merits of the issue of whether the tenant owed back rent or not. And, and again, I see that my time is, is up and we haven't even gotten to the material issues of fact as to, you know, even if, even if the court doesn't agree that this was an adjudication on the merits and the issue of whether the tenant owes back rent or not has been resolved and the landlord has admitted that the tenant owes nothing. There are at a minimum, at a minimum, there are issues of fact as to the counterclaims and the trial court below and the superior court acknowledged those issues of fact and, and just disregarded them. They were material issues of fact. Can I ask you 
one theme uh, to, to take the counterclaims uh, collectively and ask a kind of a, g a generic question about them. Uh, one theme of the trial court summary judgment order was uh, that uh, the opposition to the motion for summary judgment and the other documents that were filed in the trial court didn't really adequately tee up material disputes of fact. It didn't, you know, uh, uh, um, and so the trial court treated as sort of undisputed, for example, things like, well, was there ever, were there written uh, invoices paid? Um, and the trial court kind of looking at the uh, opposition to the motion for summary judgment said, there doesn't seem to be a dispute of fact here. Um, do you agree that the uh, opposition to the motion for summary judgment and the materials filed in connection with that uh, are uh, uh, relatively lacking in uh, what, you're ex what one would expect from such documents? So I can understand the lower court's frustration with my, my client's prior counsel, and I share that frustration, um, but that is, that is the record that's there. However, I will say that the, the job of the lower court, and, I, and, I, and I, again, I empathize with the frustration, their job is to view everything in a light most favorable to the opponent of, opponent of summary judgment. And I think the cases cited in our briefs reflect that even if my clients had not put in anything at all, the landlord still had not met their burden. They still have to meet their burden of proof. And at a minimum, although inartfully drawn. Well, that, that, there, let me just make sure I understand, because there's a burden shifting point you make in your brief and you seem to be adverting to it here. I'm not quite sure I understand it. So let me just ask you a hypothetical to see if, if your position is what I think it is. Um, imagine that I file a lawsuit and I say, you know, uh, my opponent, uh, the defendant breached a contract. Um, so my complaint has some allegations. Um, and imagine, though, that I... Uh, uh, don't attach the contract and imagine that I, uh, you know, don't notice any depositions. I don't submit any affidavits. And my opponent comes in and says, well, I mean, I'm not seeking dismissal of the complaint. The complaint itself seems to make some allegations that meet the dismissal standard, but I'm entitled to summary judgment. There is a complaint, but there's no evidence. Uh, there's no deposition testimony. We don't have a contract. Um, is it your view that the trial court conf confronted with a record like that should grant summary judgment, or at times, or do you think no, that actually your opponent would, or my opponent would, in this hypothetical would have to have come in and said, oh, by the way, here is the contract, and I can show you that I, you know, if you're going to reach the merits, I would win. So that's do you think it's the former or the latter? So I respectfully judge, I think that's a hard hypothetical to answer because I think on summary judgment, it, it depends, as all of them do, because all of the facts are different. So I, the, the only, the best way that I can answer that question is that in this case, there was enough, right? There were dueling affidavits. There's one from Chris Willoughby and there's one from Ryan Burke. They are equally conclusory, right? So when you have equally conclusory affidavits, I don't think that the judge could have, and in my view should have said, it's not enough, right? And at a minimum, Ryan Burke's affidavit said, and the deposition testimony the landlord themselves put in said that my client, Ryan Burke said, I gave him the invoices. He had the invoices. This is a case where Chris Willoughby was at the bar. His, his family had owned this bar previously for like decades. He was always at the bar. They were friendly. They went out to dinner. My clients had been to his wedding. The, the course of con and, and Mr. Nawash does say in his papers, it was a quote unquote intimate relationship. Would I prefer that there was more detail? Of course. But the reality is that the, the lease acknowledges that personal delivery was sufficient for notice. And my client testified in a sworn affidavit that they gave him notice. He was, he was in, Chris Willoughby was in constant contact with the architect who was his friend. He had all access. And, and by the way, let's look at what Chris Willoughby didn't do, what the landlord didn't do. They never stopped work. This was an alteration work that just stopped in a day. Just so I understand the record correctly, my, my, my recollection is it was also a sworn affidavit saying that he gave him the invoices and the trial court took some issue with that because the invoices themselves were not provided to the court. Do I have that right? I believe that's correct, yes. Okay. I believe, but in a, there are other cases that are cited both in the judge's decision and in the landlord's papers that indicate that a trial judge, I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't remember if it was, um, if it was Surratt, I believe it was, that the trial judge didn't have documentation, didn't have receipts, right? And, and that, that, is, that you can still deny summary judgment even if you don't have all all of the facts. And so 
you know, I, I do. Right. I, am, I, am I also correct that they didn't dispute? I mean, they, they certainly said, oh, we didn't get all this. Uh, we didn't get pre-approval pre -approval in writing. We didn't give that in writing the way that the contract required. Did they ever say, actually, no, we never got any invoices? Was that part of? I don't believe they did. I think they, I believe okay. they said there was no proof. And by the way, if the landlord didn't object after notice within 10 days, the approval was deemed given. So there's a latches argument. There's a waiver argument. I mean, they let all this stuff be done to the exterior of the building. And now they have a building that's had $2 million of renovations only to come back 10 months later, which again, by the way, they never issued an event of a default. They never said, hey, stop doing the work to my building. There's a building permit that was issued to the owner, right? The receipt says to the owner. So, I mean, it, it's just... It, there is an estoppel argument there as well for the landlord to say, no, you're not entitled to the rent abatement on a technicality, but then also saying that they shouldn't be held to their obligations. They never notified New Tech. They had, they had to notify New Tech, the lender, on the non-interference agreement that they signed. So it's, it's really disingenuous for them to be taking that, that position at a minimum that, that should not have been the judge's um, conclusion. All right, counsel, uh, we're, you're over your time. We'll give you three minutes in rebuttal and we'll hear now from Mr. LaFont. Thank you, your honors, I appreciate it. Thank you, your honors, and good morning. Uh, Chris LaFont for appellees here. I, I just wanted to jump into the issues. I, I know several questions have been raised regarding res judicata. Um, one, I, I do not think it is a jurisdictional issue here. I believe it is an issue that it could be a defense to a claim. Um, I don't think this court doesn't have jurisdiction based upon that, and I think the law supports that. Um, second, here, due to the uniqueness of the divisions uh, of D.C. courts, once an agreement, which was reached here regarding possession, uh, was entered, the court didn't have jurisdiction. The court would have never had jurisdiction over the claims against the guarantors, no matter what. The, the division is set up to basically award possession, and even though damages were sought here, Initially in default, I was in the court, submitted an electronic copy of the ledger in a motion, not on a determination for substantive conclusion. And I mean, you, you said, certainly could have, you know, you, you brought a claim for both possession and back rent, and you certainly could have settled those claims, right? I, I, I don't know what, what point you're advancing by saying jurisdiction. I mean, the question is whether or not the settlement that you reached and the judgment entered by the landlord tenant court covered those back rent claims that you had raised as well. Right, I don't, I don't believe it did. The parties didn't reach any agreement based on the amount that was owed. Can I ask how, 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 no, go ahead, Joe. I was just gonna say how, what are we supposed to look at to draw that determination? I think you can look at the fact of it wasn't one way or another set in the consent judgment that was provided to the court. The, the parties basically chose to kick it down the road. That was why there was an X'd out or marked out sentence there because the parties didn't want to agree that the landlord would sue the tenant. The tenant wanted to try to work something out. They didn't Can want I ask to you a question about, uh, you said something uh, and it went by quickly and I want to make sure I uh, slow down and, and see if I understand your argument. Are you saying that, uh, imagine what had happened is uh, the parties agree to possession uh, you know, to, to, a, to a judgment of possession. And imagine they had said to the trial judge, we're, we're, we're sorted out possession, you go ahead and you could enter a judgment for possession. But we still have this matter of money damages and we can't, haven't been able to settle that. So we would like to litigate that in landlord tenant court. We wanna finish this, that half of this litigation. Are you saying the trial court would have lacked authority to do that? No, 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 your honor, no. I, what was here was not as explicit as that, I agree. But I don't think under the rules of the court, it has to be. I believe that once possession is determined here through a consent judgment, that the L&T branch would have lacked jurisdiction, even if the parties wanted to go on and litigate the issue of damage. Well, now you're, I, I guess I'm, why it, it, is it kind of a sequencing of events? So if, imagine in the hypothetical I was just giving you, the trial judge says, okay, fine, I'm gonna enter partial judgment on possession because everybody agrees with that. And let's you know, finish the fight uh, on uh, money damages in landlord tenant court. Are you saying that that's not a, an available option? As soon as the trial court enters partial judgment uh, pursuant to an agreement about possession that the landlord tenant court loses any authority to resolve the rest of the dispute? Is, is that your theory? Um. Yes, that the landlord tenant court, once possession is determined, 
that it wouldn't have jurisdiction basically to go on and determine the issue of damage. And are there provisions, are there specific landlord tenant rules you're relying on when you make that assertion? I'm uh, relying chiefly on case law stating that the landlord tenant branch is concerned with possession first, um, as well as the, the rule stating that the, the branch is basically in effect to determine possession with ancillary issue of uh, rent and arrears to be owed. But, but I think here the parties didn't need to be so explicit and tell the court anything. Once the issue of possession was determined, the, the clerk knew the case was closed. Um, they didn't go to the court one way or another. They, they certainly could have, but they didn't. But that still permitted the landlord to bring an action in the civil branch, both against the tenant and as well as the guarantors who couldn't have been parties anyway to the landlord tenant case um, and to seek damages from each of them individually and collectively. I, I don't think they had to proceed in the landlord tenant branch regarding just the back rent that was owed. Um, it was certainly made an argument here by the tenants in the landlord tenant court that because they had already given possession that that court shouldn't have jurisdiction either. So I, I think the parties were trying to reach an agreement on the initial issue of possession that was agreed and the parties didn't need to tell the court or to proceed in that branch regarding the back rent, particularly because, you know, as in most cases with a single use entity, it makes more sense to include the guarantors as well to litigate that once. So that made more practical sense to go in the civil division bring the claims there. Um, Although that wasn't the judgment you made initially. That was the strategic decision originally was to go ahead and uh, seek money damages in landlord tenant along with the, the, the uh, uh, possession dispute. Correct. The, the claim was definitely made there. Um, there was no determination by the court of the substantive issue of whether any money damages were owed. The court basically on a or well, well, your opponent argues, I'm not sure this was in her brief, I'd have to go back and look, because uh, I don't remember zeroing in on it as much as we've been discussing it today, but your opponent argues, in fact, there was a determination at one point, because there was a default, and then there was an effort to prove damages on the premise of default, and the trial court said, well, you whiffed on damages, so I'm going to, and I'm going to undo default. Uh, what's your response to, to that line of argument? Right, the court didn't make a substantive determination of the damages owed. I was there in court and submitted an electronic ledger. The court said, come back with the paper ledger. I'm releasing default. I'm not going to order. I'm not going to make an order on money damages today. It wasn't removed from the ability for that court to decide that if the parties hadn't agreed to possession and um, the clerk closed the case. And that's what was reflected on the docket as well. Um, here, the parties, the way they proceeded was correct under the rules of the courts uh, and the divisions. Um, and here, I don't think anything is, is precluded, particularly against the guarantors, when the guarantor allowed basically that the landlord could have left the tenant alone and gone after the guarantors um, for the amounts owed on the lease, which is the purpose of the, having a guarantee so that you aren't limited to going after was here sole purpose entity. And their individuals, even though they were perhaps privies with the tenant, that doesn't go to the issue of race judicata because the issues aren't the same. There are two separate contracts and the guarantee was never part of the, the record that was in the L&T court, nor could it have been. And that's the way that the parties um, proceeded and went against the guarantors uh, as well as the tenant in the civil division. Did you want to turn to the uh, counterclaims and uh, focusing, I guess, uh, first on the abatement claim? Uh, your opponent's argument is that uh, there were really material disputes of fact uh, relating to whether some of the requirements to achieve the uh, abatement had been met and whether others of them might have been waived by conduct and the like, and that the trial court just didn't get that right and, for example, said there's no dispute about invoices when there was. What's your response to, to uh, your opponent's argument on that point? I think uh, my opponent is an abled attorney and certain has created the best arguments um, that she could have. But the record here is simply that there is there was no factual dispute. Um, we submitted an affidavit which said that the landlord's agent never received invoices. There was no evidence submitted otherwise in the summary judgment record. 
Um, my opponent categorizes in her briefing at one point the actual opposition to the motion as a quash affidavit, but that, that was the attorney's filing. There was no affidavit submitted with respect to summary judgment briefing. Um, there, and it's frankly under Rule 56, the, the parties have burdens of, that they have to undertake. It's not the court's job to go through everything and, uh, and see if there's an interrogatory answer on point. The party here didn't pinpoint site. There was nothing in the record saying that here invoices were provided. The other side saying, no, they weren't. There's simply no invoices were provided and then silence. The, the tenant here does say that there were oral discussions going forward. But the lease didn't call for oral. And particularly here, it's important because the abatement doesn't kick in until you spend tens of thousands of dollars. So it's not a dollar for dollar rent abatement reduction. So without written invoices being provided, there would simply be no way for a landlord to know how much rent to abate or to abate the maximum amount. That just wasn't provided here. It's not part of the record. It's certainly if it would have behooved the tenant or the guarantors if they had those invoices to submit them in response to summary judgment motion, but none was made here. And the the abatement well, I mean is it would it be so I my memory of the record is a little bit different than yours would it be sufficient to survive summary judgment if the testimony was we provided them with paid invoices that, that, that an affidavit in support of appellants said we provided them with paid invoices um and but they didn't actually supply those for the record would that be sufficient to survive summary judgment on the question um the it, it would, I, again, I think it would depend, but I think that would be a different situation here, that there was a dispute over the invoices and the amounts of the invoices. And can you tell me where, so I recall that in your side, the affidavit said things like, they didn't comply with each of the statutory, with each of the contractual requirements, which is to say they didn't do A, B, C, and D. One of those things was providing paid invoices, but... The only thing that's clear is that they didn't do all of those things. They seem, seem to say we definitely didn't get invoices. Am I am I misreading that? Can you point me to where in the record? Yeah, um, on um, the joint appendix, page one forty three, number thirteen. And I apologize, if my camera is out because I'm looking at it right now. It says specifically the tenant did not submit complete plans and specification of facade work. Provide that's, a, that's exactly what I was describing though. Okay. It's saying they didn't do each of these things necessary for an abatement, including receive prior written approval, it doesn't say that they didn't do any of those things. It just said, you know, it's, it's a general denial that they did the things necessary under the contract. It doesn't say they didn't do A, they didn't do B, they didn't do C, they didn't do D. It says they didn't do A, B, C, and D together. You understand the distinction? Yes. Uh -huh. there, there's no and or there. Um, but but I, I believe that it, it there was nothing in the record stating otherwise that paid invoices were provided, nor were they provided in discovery here. Um, and we frankly have never seen them. Um, so I, I would submit that the record as it exists now does support that there's not a factual issue regarding whether paid invoices were provided or not. I mean, I think there's- No, go ahead, go ahead, Joshua. So I, I think their general point is we did the work. You know, we did the work, you were there. You approved it all the way along and, and all, any other breach of the contractual provisions was immaterial and generally waived by your client. And what's your response to that? I mean, because I, th I think what the trial court said was, well, whatever about that, it needs to be in writing and it wasn't. So I'm going to grant summary judgment, which seems to be go whistling by the graveyard of the waiver argument that they're making. Right. I, I understand that. And I, I I don't think there was a factual dispute here uh, regarding these issues. Um, and there was no evidence submitted. There was no evidence submitted basically that writings did occur that were between them. I, I understand what you're saying. It's basically- the Can I, can I ask you just to clarify, uh, just to try to nail this down on the other half of the record. You're saying that your belief is there is nothing sworn whether in the form, uh, uh, whether in the form of depositions or affidavits or anything, but there's nothing sworn supporting an assertion that it presented to the trial court, uh, supporting an assertion that invoices, that written invoices were provided uh, uh, to the uh, landlord. Yes, that's that's my understanding. The 
record, Your Honor. I, I do believe that there is an interrogatory answer saying that plans were submitted to the landlord. And I think that- um, Their interrogatory answer 11 at 134 of the appendix says the question, identify whether you provided plaintiffs with copies of paid invoices for work performed at the property. Answer, we have provided plaintiff with all the invoices for all work performed on the property. Does, does that not do it for you? Well, Your Honor, no invoices were provided. And none were provided. I, I, that during. sounds like a dispute of fact. I mean, they say they were. Yeah, I don't think it was because they weren't provided and discovery weren't provided in response to oh, this. No, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a different question. I mean, but they say through their interrogatories, we provided all the invoices. And so, I mean, you might say, look, if there's a dispute, you've got to provide the actual copies or you don't get past summary judgment. That's one argument. I don't think it's a very good one, but I think that's the argument you're left with. Right, and I also um, hear, Your Honor, the the tenant and the guarantors didn't provide that information to the court in the summary judgment record. They didn't rely on that. They didn't cite to it in their papers. They didn't rely on that argument. Can I ask you a related question? I get that, but um, are, were, the, were these answers to interrogatories sworn? They were, uh, I can look, Your Honor, but I believe they were um, verified, not sworn. If, uh, uh, I apologize for not knowing that, Your Honor. And uh, what, what do you understand the distinction to be between those two things? Well, here, Your Honor, it, it simply says they were respectfully submitted. Um, they're not verified or sworn. It doesn't, um, from my view, my quick view of that, the record. And if they were unsworn, or uh, I'm not 100% sure uh, how to parse what verified would mean as distinct from sworn in the setting, but if they were unsworn and unverified, would they be su a sufficient basis upon which to oppose summary judgment? I would state no, Your Honor, under the Rule 56 regarding um, issues of material fact, both they, they weren't cited and here they weren't sworn or verified um, in any aspect that would contradict sworn verified testimony through an affidavit. Uh, unless my colleagues have uh, further questions, I see that your time has expired. If you have a, you want to take a minute to wrap up? Yes, sir. I, I appreciate that, but I'll wait to see if any questions. Um, if, if not, um, Your Honors, I, I, I believe here that the issue is clear with regard to res judicata and not being applicable due to the LNT's limited jurisdiction after the parties agreed to possession, as well as the party's ability to go forward in the civil division and still seek, um, which is something that's very typical in DC. Um, and I believe here that the simply, it's not a matter of uh, whether a certain document was filed that said disputed material facts here uh, with respect to the factual issues on the counterclaims, but simply that there were no facts that were provided that actually support the instance of a disputed fact with regard to any of the facts that were determined for the court. Even on the idea of an agreement, um, those supposedly between the parties, a consent agreement in that, with respect to that, there was no issue that there was no dispute of fact regarding that the tenant simply didn't suffer any damages and no support for that. Um, I appreciate the court's time and indulgence. Thank you, counsel. Uh, Ms. Besunder, we'll give you three minutes in rebuttal. Thank you, your honors. Um, a few quick points. Um, with respect to the last topic about whether this was sworn or if it was not sworn, my clients invested almost $2 million into this property and uh, trying to make a go of it. Um, they had developed a close relationship with Chris Willoughby. Um, and by the time this was, when, was done, and they had obviously failed at the endeavor, they were completely exhausted and tapped out financially. And unfortunately, they, they retained an attorney. And I, 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 I am in a tough spot to have to say this, but they retained an attorney who you know, I, I think they relied on and maybe didn't lead them into the right direction. So I would submit that my client put in a document that he assumed based on his counsel's advice was sufficient for the summary judgment. You know, obviously these things are drafted by counsel and that it was submitted to the court. And I would, I would ask the court to agree that 
the submission of a signed document to a court is as good as a sworn document, especially when it was accompanied and submitted by an attorney. I mean, so, I think I think you might have a, an alternative argument available to you, which is that was not the basis on which the trial court ruled that this was not sworn because that might have been easily cured. Instead, it was sort of a if it's not in writing, then you don't get abatement. And that strikes me, at least, as, as brushing by some pretty serious arguments about a waiver of that requirement. But I agree. Um, I, and I and I agree with that, Your Honor. Thank you. It's not the exclusive argument, but it is one of the arguments. What the what the judge did here um, is that there, in turning to that decision, there are mistakes of fact and law on the face of the lower court's decision that warrant reversal, and the underpinnings of the court's decision falter when it's examined closely as well. And even the when you look at the cases that the lower court cited, it supports a conclusion opposite of what the lower court did here. And some of those cases were taken from the landlord's brief involving university cases and employment cases. So for example, the standard of malice on the fraudulent misrepresentation um, case doesn't really apply in a commercial lease here. It might apply to university cases and whether an employee has the ability to find the university, but those are that's not the case here. Um, and so, you know, here, when you look at the issues of fact, and, and you're, you're correct, the court said, well, these invoices aren't here, but you have one, you have one party, Chris Willoughby saying, I never got them. And you have another party, Ryan Burke at PHC saying, we gave him everything. And they had the architect and you've been taken into combination with all of the other pieces here where the landlord never said, hey, stop investing all of this money into my facade. Um, I think it combines to, to show that there, at a minimum, there was an issue of credibility that should have warranted a trial. And here, I think the key point is that the movement has to make a prima facie case, and they didn't. In the landlord-tenant court, they charted their own- I guess so you, that's where I, I, you lose me again there, um, because uh, I, I would have thought, and I, I may be wrong, so uh, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I would have thought that one way a, a movement for summary judgment can win is to say, my opponent filed a complaint. It alleges some things. My opponent has put on no evidence to support those claims. I'm not putting in any evidence. I'm not gonna to try to prove anything. I'm just gonna point out that the only, we, we are not gonna have a trial unless my opponent has supported the allegations in the complaint with evidence that would allow a reasonable fact finder to rule for my opponent. That hasn't happened, so grant summary judgment. I don't have to tell you any facts. And so, it, it, do you disagree that that's a way someone can defeat a claim, uh, can prevail in a, in, in a motion for summary judgment? Again, in, from a 10,000 foot up, maybe. But here, if what you're talking about is the counterclaims, so my clients direct claims and the counterclaims and submitting that, those, those counterclaims actually hadn't been through discovery. So those claims had been added afterwards. And even the landlord admitted that discovery had not happened. And what they were trying to avoid was discovery on um, the, the fraudulent misrepresentation claims um, against Chris Willoughby. Well, that seems like uh, another set of procedural issues that haven't been teed up right, for right, us right. in the briefing. Well, it, uh, Judge, Judge Green? Ms. Besender, your, your client has not filed any kind of action for uh, malpractice or otherwise against trial counsel, against its trial counsel in this case, has it? So all I can say is that the statute of limitations has not run yet on that claim and I, I, I because of attorney client privilege I can't really say anything okay. but no there hasn't there hasn't been a filing yet. Okay. And 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 I will I will say your honor and I think I can say this safely my clients thought that they were done in the landlord tenant proceeding. They thought that you know they had given the landlord an outfitted building billing that was ready for the, the the landlord who had previously owned a bar to come in and open up the bar. They'd done the exterior. They'd done extensive work in the in the in the thing. And and I think also if the court would look at the fact that when the landlord tenant action was done, when the consent judgment was signed, landlord did not go across the street or go upstairs and file their superior court action. It took them four months. And as I raised in my papers, of which the court I would respectfully submit can take judicial notice, Mr. Willoughby himself was going through a bankruptcy proceeding at that time. So I, I don't think that when you look at the entire chronology of what happened as evidence of what the party's intention were, the, the fact that the landlord didn't serve a notice of default for 10 months, they only did it and said, hey, by the way, $178,000 is due and you have to pay it in five days. Um, you know, they did seek the back rent. They tried to make an evidentiary show and they didn't. And then after that, they didn't do anything for four months until they said, hey, you know what, let's go shake the tree and if we can get some more. And I, and just to, there was a lot in my, um, my able opponent's um, presentation that I had wanted to address. 
Um, but I, I would also just um, just submit again that this was this was a strategic decision by the landlord, um, and that I, I I would rest on the rest of my arguments on the brief unless um, your honors have some additional questions. Thank you, counsel. We thank you both for your briefs and your arguments. And the case is submitted, and the court will take a brief recess to reconstitute the division. Thank you, your honors, for your time. This court is back in session. Please come to order. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have one final case we'll be hearing this morning. It's number 19BG0674 in Ray Evan J. Crane. Uh, and Mr. Marks, I think we should begin. Good, good morning. Uh, may it please the court. Good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew. Andrew Marks. Oh, Your Honor, I'm getting a feedback. Uh, yes, and I'm, you're breaking up too. I think I'm going to mute myself. That may help. I see everybody else is muted. Let's see how it goes if I do that. Why don't you try speaking once I mute myself and let's see if we hear it then. Mr. Marks, can you hear me? Mr. Marks? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm here, but I'm getting, I'm getting- Oh, a you're still feedback. getting it? And were you getting it even after I muted myself? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Green, do you have a suggestion for us? We'll, we'll, we'll restart your time, Mr. Marks. I'm not getting any feedback on my end. I suspect it's exclusively on your end, but- Nor am I. Do you, you don't happen to have the YouTube channel open on a different source, because yes. that's a- Let me try it. Because if that's open, that's a, a standard uh, okay. uh, source of that kind of feedback. Thank you, Mr. Marks. Let's try that again. Okay. And uh, Ricardo, can we, start a, can we start the time over? Uh, right. yes, I, I apologize. Uh, let's hope. Let's hope I do better. I think that was a uh, rookie error on yeah, my. Yeah, let's part. see if it works. I am going to mute myself though, and let's see if that helps. And Great. you can begin when you're ready. Thank you very much. May it please the court. My name is Andrew Marks. I am counsel for respondent Evan Crame in this proceeding, which comes to the court on exceptions to a disbarment recommendation by the board of professional responsibility. This court has emphasized repeatedly that the ultimate sanction of disbarment is reserved for cases of criminal or otherwise extreme misconduct. There is no basis for such a finding in this case. Indeed, disciplinary counsel did not even ask the board to recommend disbarment to the court. Who is Evan Crame and what did he do that would warrant the extreme sanction proposed here? Mr. Crame is a lawyer of skill and integrity who has an extraordinary record of service to the disabled and elderly communities in our region over the course of a distinguished professional career spanning more than 35 years. Those are not my words. Those are the words, uh, the express findings of the hearing committee that conducted an extensive 10-day evidentiary hearing in this matter that heard testimony from Mr. Crame over the course of five days, that considered hundreds of witnesses, that considered evidence a character testimony and found it credible. That is what the hearing committee found. And what did Mr. Crane do that warrants, that would warrant such a recommendation? He was admittedly overzealous 15 years ago in 2006 in advocating that trustees of special needs trusts in the District of Columbia be paid a 1% fee rather than be required to petition for fees on the basis of hours and rates. Okay, I mean, let's, I'm gonna stop you there. Um, oh. It is, you can paint it as advocacy. But another way to put it is when he was told to submit time entries by a court, because we're not gonna give you 1%, what he did was he manufactured a bunch of time entries so that it equaled exactly 1% uh, that he thought he was entitled to. That's not advocacy. That's what we might call fraud on the court. Uh, I would respectfully disagree. First of all, there's no finding of manufacture uh, there was reconstruction of his time. That, that, that ended up just, just as a matter of fact, landing on, at least in one instance, exactly the 1% fee that he thought he was entitled to, to uh, recoup without any time entries, right? 
right? And in the, in the, in the other matter, just to what was in fact his time was substantially more than 1%. So his 1% advocacy was not in a, uh, uh, an effort for greed. It was clearly, as the, as the hearing committee found, uh, was a matter of principle. Even, even the dissenting member of the hearing committee, Mr. Kassoff, who uh, uh, had you know, some very harsh criticisms of Mr. Crane, uh, said that, uh, that he was not motivated by an effort to take money he wasn't entitled to. He was on a crusade. And Mr. Crane has expressed remorse. He, he, he violated two orders of the court. He should not have done that. And he expressed remorse for that. But there was no manufacturer or evidence, no, certainly no clear and convincing evidence of manufacture of any time entries. Uh, uh, it was, they, they, they were supported, they were reconstructed in a process that uh, any of us would, if we have to reconstruct time would do. There were four time entries, Your Honor. Where, I was gonna ask about those. Uh, yeah, there are only, but four time entries. Now, uh, as, as you know, they totaled $860, okay? $860 out of a $90,000 fee request that was approved by the court. There are four time entries, two in the Brown case, two in the Baker matter, uh, and uh, uh, they're clearly not part of any scheme for $860, uh, and, and there were four out of 740 time entries. Now, Mr. Crane, the, the, the hearing committee rejected expressly the contention that, there was in, that he intended to deceive, but it, it had questions and said he wasn't supported. And, and therefore it found it, it found it was reckless. And Mr. Crane accepted the fact, okay, that, that, that he, he was not diligent enough in supporting those and he accepted the reckless finding. But that's the limit of what the evidence supports, Your Honor. Uh, and, um, and Mr. Crane obviously was, was uh, in a difficult spot in front of the hearing committee. By virtue of the passage of time, uh, this, the hearing was in 2016. He was asked to go back seven years before and reconstruct what he, how he reconstructed. And he was very candid with the hearing committee. They found his testimony credible. And they, they're, they're, we respectfully submit there's no basis for finding any manufacture or intent uh, to deceive the court. He tried to build a record uh, for an appeal, which actually came to this court in the NRA DMB case. Uh, and, this, uh, and he was overzealous in building the record. And he was wrong and he admits it, he expressed remorse. But um, uh, the, uh, the, there was a litany of charges, uh, uh, really, uh, uh, a, a remarkable litany of charges asserted by the disciplinary council. And the hearing committee expressly found, and I quote, no pattern or course of misconduct in respondent's law practice or trust practice including his approximately 60 special needs trust in the period relevant to this proceeding was alleged or even suggested. The hearing committee had a firsthand opportunity. As I mentioned, he test Mr. Crane testified and was cross-examined in depth over the course of five hearing days. They had a firsthand opportunity to assess his credibility and demeanor. And on that basis, they rejected each of the four charges of deliberate dishonesty in which the board made de novo findings. Now, do you agree that you know, whether or not his misstatements were reckless, no or deliberate, you agree that that is sort of an ultimate termination of fact, which from time to time we seem to say gets de novo review by the board and by us. Um, what, what's your reaction to the board's uh, interpreting our case law to say, look, on that question of mens rea, it's an ultimate question. We have to know of a review and you know, whatever Mr. Crane testified to, he might've sold the hearing committee on it, but we don't buy it. Uh, thank you for that question. It, 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 it really goes to the core of this appeal, Your Honor. Uh, this court has consistently, consistently held that the determination of state of mind issues are not ultimate issues of fact, they're evidentiary issues of fact. Uh, in the Pye case in which Judge McLeese sat, Clearly the question of whether something was a mistake or intent and the court expressly held that in Pi, uh, that was a, an evidentiary fact. In Gadet, which is really a seminal case for this court, the court held the question of, uh, uh, of, of whether someone was deliberately uh, evading service of process was an issue of evidentiary fact. Mr. Marks, I take half of your point that we certainly have done it sometimes. I, I guess where I get hung up is the word consistently in your comment. Sure. Because there are cases like uh, in Ray Tun, 
uh, or, or which cites a case called Bradley that uh, say uh, this is an issue of credibility. Uh, whether the uh, uh, respondent in a partisan matter gave false testimony in front of the hearing committee. And we say, well, ordinarily we defer to that, but this is a quote from Bradley quoted in, 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 in Ray Tun, whether a respondent gave sanctionable, i.e. intentional false testimony before the hearing committee is a question of ultimate fact, uh, of ultimate legal fact that the board and this court reviewed de novo. Uh, and so I guess where I'm, I, I'm hung up on the word consistently uh, in, in your statement. Great. I, I, I welcome the opportunity to address that. And of course, Judge Thompson uh, uh, knows the Bradley case and the Tun case because she was on both panels and she wrote the Tun opinion. So uh, 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 let me say this. First, let me distinguish. The, uh, the extent those cases uh, um, do go in, the, in an, uh, what I think is an aberrant direction there, it's about the testimony. So with respect to the other uh, findings of dishonesty, which related, uh, as the court knows, uh, to the preparation of the four time entries uh, and to um, um, uh, isolated sentences in, in, in some in submissions in the Brown and Bradley case in 2000, uh, sorry, the Brown and Baker cases in 2006. Those, Bradley doesn't reach those questions. Those, those are- But actually that distinction seems kind of backwards. I would think if the issue is to what extent should this court and the board defer to a determination by the hearing committee about truthfulness. If the truthfulness relates to someone who was sitting in front of the hearing committee and testifying, you would think deference would be at its zenith I as opposed to a question of deference uh, on the issue of, well, let's figure out whether someone was uh, intentionally making false statements, not in front of the hearing committee that's deciding that in the first instance, but instead kind of out of uh, you know, you know, uh, out of the presence of the hearing committee, and then you're trying to take evidence on both sides, and then maybe also you'll have some testimony to assess about all that. But I, the distinction seems a little backwards to me. I well, I, 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 I couldn't agree more, Your Honor. Uh, and and here, the, uh, let me just make it clear: the hearing committee expressly considered the question of whether his testimony was credible, and they unanimously found it was. So. So there, the, uh, with respect to, I should say, the majority found it, it, it was it was credible on the, on on his testimony there. So I agree. When it comes to the firsthand de uh, demeanor and credibility, I agree with you that it, 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 the zenith of the zenith is when it's in front of the testimony. But the rest of his testimony is also. No, but if, again, my, my question was not so much about this case. Where, uh, but but you, you were trying to say our cases. Uh, you were saying our cases consistently do one thing. I was saying, well, there's some other cases that seem to raise questions of consistency. So, and if I understood your point, it was, well, those cases are different. They, you know, uh, applied de novo review in the setting where the testimony it was live testimony in front of the hearing committee. And I was just observing that doesn't seem like a very good way of introducing a, a different kind of consistency because you would think the inferences would be, you know, we'd be more likely to defer in cases like that. And if we won't defer there. Then I would think, why would we be deferring, and why would the board be required to defer in cases that don't involve kind of the zenith of deference? And so, I, so I, that's where I'm puzzled still. Yeah, well, I, I'm sorry because I, I I I took a little bit of a detour. Let me answer your question very directly. The Bradley case is the is the case. Okay, I'll talk about Tun or Tune in a second. The Bradley case is the case that is the exception to the rule. But if you read Bradley. Uh, what Bradley stands for, it, it, the question is, uh, there's deference and zenith of deference, but deference doesn't mean abdication. We've never argued that, that just because there's a finding of credibility by a hearing committee, that means that there's no role for the board or the court. But it is still cabined by the substantial evidence standard. What Bradley stands for is, and the, uh, the finding, there was no substantial evidence to support the hearing committee's finding of, of no false testament false testimony, that the whole record, in Bradley uh, is a case where, where the respondent manufactured an extraordinary level of detail uh, that was provably wrong by other witnesses and documents, and she conceded she made false statements. Um, so the entire record, in, there was the, the, what the court held in Bradley, I submit, is that uh, the court will not defer, and the board does not need to defer to a finding of uh, no dishonesty 
where the record is overwhelmingly proves the opposite. Ton in the, I mean, the difficulty case, with that reading of Bradley, just to, to, to just, I, I mean, I get your point that maybe you could distinguish Bradley on his facts because it was a case where even if there had been deference, there really shouldn't, you know, uh, the, the determination was so contrary to the record that it wouldn't have been entitled to prevail notwithstanding deference. But the difficulty with that reading of Bradley in terms of what it tells us the, our law is, is it doesn't say that. What, you know, the quote in Ton from Bradley is a statement of law that seems general which is, you know, whether there was intentional false testimony in front of the hearing committee is a question of ultimate legal fact that the board of this court reviewed de novo. It's not like we said, well, it's true, we should defer, but this is just, you know, the record is ridiculous here. And so deference doesn't carry the day. We stated what seemed to state a general legal rule, which is if it's, uh, you know, the issue of false testimony in front of the hearing committee, that's, uh, you know, although ordinarily there's deference to credibility, that's an ultimate fact. And therefore the board is free to, to decide it is required, I guess, to decide it to know, and so, and so too are we. So I, I guess I'm just, uh, I'm not sure that Bradley is written in a way to uh, be as narrow as you're suggesting we should read it. Well, I, I would respectfully- Is this the case, uh, Mr. Marks, in which you think the board uh, sort of overruled a, a credibility finding that was based on demeanor while testifying as opposed to the kind of thing that Judge McLeese was just describing, as opposed to uh, rejecting a credibility determination because the facts testified to were demonstrably false or inconsistent with the rest of the record. Which, which is this? It's the former, Your Honor. Uh, there's no finding by the board uh, of facts, uh, 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 a record of facts that contradict the testimony that was found expressly credible on multiple occasions by, by the hearing committee. Uh, so this is this is not a case where there's a a a, a, a factual record that would some, some uh, frankly would would even uh, um, uh, uh, satisfy a preponderance standard. But of course, uh, the board and the court, if the if you're going to find uh, make a, a ultimate finding, you've got to find it on whether is there clear and convincing evidence, and there is no evidence that would that that is remotely clear and convincing that would override. That express demeanor findings um, by the hearing committee, Your Honor. Uh, in you know, I, I, I agree with you sometimes and sometimes not. There, there's at least one through the padded time entries uh, finding by the hearing committee seemed to be look common sense would dictate that the way he added some time entries to get up to one percent exactly, um, common sense would dictate that is uh, was a knowingly false. Uh, record that he submitted to the court, but we can't really consult our common sense so much because there's no available documentation that, that really substantiates that. That to me does not sound so much like a credibility finding, but it sounds very much like a given the circumstances, uh, we can't find uh, that this was knowingly false and the board said, well, or you know, I, I think disciplinary counsel here is arguing, well, well, yeah, actually you can, you can consult your common sense uh, in a way that the hearing committee I think, and the board said that you could not. Well, again, the, the, the only finding of, of dishonesty with respect to time entries that the board found, okay, had to do with the four entries. Right, right. I, 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 I said the board not, did not, the, the board was right. on your side on this one. They were, they were. Uh, but the absolutely. disciplinary still, council still takes exception to it, saying, you know, consult your common sense, guys. Yeah, well, I think the disciplinary council is, 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 uh, uh, overreaching in the extreme by asking, taking a third bite at the apple. The hearing committee rejected their argument, the board rejected their argument. Now they're asking the court to come and, and, and make, and, 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 you know, consult quote unquote common sense. But the facts, the fact, factual record does not support that there was any uh, uh, scheme of any, of any kind here, okay? There was a reconstruction of the time. It was, the, the courts reviewed it, okay? Uh, they approved it based on the, uh, on, on, on the petitions that he submitted. Um, so respectfully, uh, Your Honor, I, I don't believe there's any basis for this court de novo, certainly, uh, to find that there was a uh, 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 dishonesty beyond the four time entries. And with respect to the four time entries, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the board decision, um, I mean, they frankly played fast and loose. They said, well, it, it, it was, you know, incredible because his time entries, you know, happened to add up exactly to what he had uh, deleted. He didn't say that. He said he, based on his reconstruction, he, he had worked at least that amount of time 
Uh, he thought he'd actually work more time in those days, but you know, he, he, did, he, did, he submitted what was on, was on his record. I wanna come, to, uh, if I could, to uh, the, the Tun case, uh, because in that case, in fact, uh, uh, Judge McLeese, while uh, uh, the court, and specifically Judge Thompson, recites the Bradley case, okay, it doesn't follow it, okay? The, it, 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 it's frankly, uh, I, I don't mean to, in, in, in polite or impolitic way, it's dictum because what the court does in that case, uh, okay, what the court does in that case is it affirms and defers as is proper and appropriate the hearing committee findings with respect, that were that Mr. Tun uh, engaged in pervasive dishonesty. So- I'm sorry, uh, the, the court reached the same conclusion but I don't know that it deferred. No, it did. It it it, it, it I believe it did. I, well, did. I do believe it, it did. There's no suggestion. There's no suggestion. Uh, but again, uh, uh, Judge Thompson and 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 the court can, will read the opinion more carefully. You know. But I I, I believe there's clear deference uh, in the Tun case. If I, give me a second. I'll let me just reach my well, notes. I, I, on. I, there may be somewhere, but there there's the the part of it that discusses Bradley and says where our review is going to be de novo. And then there's the paragraph where they go the subsidiary facts are undisputed. Here's what people concluded. We agree with them. Uh, I don't really see where we say, uh, you know, we're deferring to them. It's uh, now maybe later on there's a place where we say something about deference, but it seemed as though the way we proceeded in the case was to say, A, it looks like we got a review de novo. B, we reviewed de novo and we reached the same conclusions that the, uh, you know, were, were previously reached. Um, well, now maybe that, so, so maybe I'm missing a part where we said we were deferring to their determinations when we were analyzing the issue. Um, let me say, the court says uh, uh, in that opinion, we are required to defer to the hearing committee credibility findings if they are supported by substantial evidence of record. So the court clearly set forth the standard that we embrace, that we embrace. Well, no, I, I mean, that's a little out of context. We say that, and then we have the next paragraph that says, right. actually, in some circumstances, we don't do that. And then we and add a whole paragraph, uh, you know, including, including uh, Bradley, and then we go ahead and have our analysis and we reach a conclusion saying we agree with the earlier conclusions without saying we're deferring is, I, is I, how I, I read it. But Fair, uh, fair, fair, fair enough. I, 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 I submit that the in some circumstances that the court is talking about in ton is the circumstance we've talked about when there's not substantial evidence, then, then to support the, the finding of the hearing committee, then of course the court has its role. But let me just say this, if this in fact and as you can tell, I strongly believe this is not a de novo issue. This is, goes to the core state of mind. And this is not just true, of course, a state of mind is not just a evidentiary issue in disciplinary matters. It's an evidentiary issue in civil matters, in criminal matters. I think it would be a radical departure from this court's jurisprudence and from the common law for the court to hold that state of mind is, is an ultimate issue of fact, that it's an issue of law. I do not believe that's consistent with, with this court's general jurisprudence or with its jurisprudence, notwithstanding Bradley, with respect to, um, uh, uh, with, with respect to the um, uh, issue of, of state of mind. Uh, you know, I, I failed to say I, I wanted to reserve five minutes. I've got a lot to say, but I want to make sure I've reserved some time and we didn't do that. So I'd like to uh, uh, ask the court how you'd like me to proceed, but I do want to reserve five minutes. Well, we will give you time on rebuttal. If you have uh, uh, another pressing point or a few that you want to be sure to make, you can make them now. We'll give you a few additional moments. Great, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I, I guess I would say say this: that uh, the uh, the Tun case, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll save most of my time on uh, for, on the sanctions issue rebuttal. But the Tun case, uh, whether it was the court de novo. Or, uh, uh, or on deference or whatever standard um, uh, involved um, a very, very much more profound uh, pattern of dishonesty, including prior, prior discipline, uh, which was a, you know, an, an aggravating circumstance. And what was the sanction the court imposed there? One year, one year. So uh, the, the notion that, that whatever is uh, uh, the board found in terms of, uh, or the court were to find in terms of uh, Mr. Uh, Crane's conduct, there is no, no warrant for the ultimate sanction of disbarment. And let me just say this, the, 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 
the linchpin of the board's recommendation was that there was a scheme. There, 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 a scheme, a, a pattern, a plan, a concerted course of action. Uh, even if the court concludes that Mr. Crane made some mistakes, and even if the court concludes that some of those mistakes were not honest as, we, as the hearing committee found, there is no clear and convincing evidence of anything that would meet a legal or common uh, uh, understanding of the word scheme. Um, uh, uh, Judge Thompson, I know in other cases, you've looked at the dictionary definition, you look at a dictionary definition, or you use your common sense here of what scheme means, there's no basis of, for scheme. And let me just say one other point, and then I'll, I'll rest. If this is a de novo de determination, in other words, if the board was allowed to substitute its judgment for that of the hearing committee, then this court owes no deference to that. If it's an ultimate issue of fact, it's a legal issue. And if it's a legal issue, this court owes no deference. And I would respectfully say, if the court you, then is gonna look at this on a de novo basis, which again, I respectfully submit is not the appropriate standard of review for an appellate body. But if you're going to, uh, uh, I submit that you will not find clear and convincing evidence to support any of the dishonesty findings. And therefore, the board's recommended sanction is clearly inappropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marks. We will give you time on rebuttal. Let's hear from uh, Ms. Neal. And Ms. Neal, um, the panel had some discussion prior to the argument about who actually ought to go first and that both sides have filed exceptions. So you should know as you begin that if you require some rebuttal time, we'll give you some as well. So oh, you, uh, proceed with that in mind. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Becky Neal. I'm representing the Office of Disciplinary Counsel. I'm going to jump right into this question of the credibility versus um, the findings of an ultimate fact or a legal conclusion. But I want to start by just saying a couple things about what we agree on. Neither, none of the parties in the board, everyone accepts the hearing committee's findings of fact. And those findings of fact which are segregated from their legal analysis includes extensive excerpts from Mr. Crame's own testimony. So this question of credibility comes up when the hearing committee will say, we credit Mr. Crame's testimony on a certain particular issue, but then they go on and they list all of his testimony. The board relied substantially on Mr. Crane's own testimony in reaching their different legal conclusion about what intent, what motive he had in the conduct that they found was dishonest. So for instance, Mr. Crane testified extensively about what drove the conduct that he even now admits was a rule violation. He admits that when he violated a court order directing him not to ask for any of his fees, to litigate the question of fees, that he did it because he thought Judge Wolf was wrong, he did it because he was being too zealous of an advocate, advocate. he believed he was right, and so that's why he violated the court order when he submitted a request for payment of $8,700 in fees out of an $18,000 statement. And he didn't declare to the court after the court had ordered him not to, that that's exactly what he was doing. So what I wanna just stress, and I'm gonna, I can turn to for exa another example in the Baker matter. So in the Baker matter, the Judge Burgess who held two extensive hearings strictly on this question, I shouldn't say strictly, um, primarily on this question of whether a percentage fee would be reasonable. After two extensive hearings where Judge Burgess said, I do not want your fee, the trustee's fee, to be expressed solely as a percentage. A year after those hearings at the first accounting, Mr. Crane filed a notice that he was collecting $17,000 in fees based on a 1% calculation. And so when Judge Wertheim asked him or denied that request and said, give us the reasons by the factors Judge Burgess inserted into the trust. He did not disclose to the court the time detailed statement he had prepared 
and that he had paid his fee based on that time statement of $12,000. So when the board looks at that conduct and then compares it to his testimony, Mr. Crame testified that in the Baker matter, and that was submitted in 2006, that for from 2005 on, he was keenly aware that the judges in probate court were looking at his fees and his time statements. And so he testified that he and his staff were using PC law, they were recording their time. And he even testified that um, when questioned by Judge Wertheim about why he didn't, uh, or why he expressed it as a percentage, he testified, I thought that the court meant it was that a cap of, of 1%. That, that meant I could just ask for 1%. And the hearing committee, when they said that they credited his explanation, this is what they said, even though our interpretation might be different. And what, what I wanna just point out that the dishonesty in this is also um, supported by his other testimony, which was, he said, I thought it was a cap, but I also was cognizant that they wanted my time and that I had to prepare my time statements and that I had to be prepared to deliver them if asked. Counsel, can I, I, I um, those are some examples of a point that you introduced in, with a broad statement that I think is also in your brief and that I find uh, puzzling on this question of deference and what is findings and what, what are findings and what are facts and the like. So you said that nobody is, to, including the, um, uh, board, uh, nobody's taking issue with the findings of the hearing committee. With the and findings the, of fact, the, Your Honor. Yeah, the, 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 the findings yes. of fact. Yes. And do you mean, I, I, are, that's sort of ambiguous, do you mean all the things that are listed in the part of the hearing committee's report that are labeled findings of fact? Or do you mean, so like that's that portion, or do you mean the things that are really uh, properly understood as factual in character and any disagreement is not on some question that is really factual, but instead all the disagreements are about things that are understood as legal. I just, I wasn't sure which of those two things you meant. Do you mean uh, the former or the latter, if you if, if you understand the distinction I'm, I'm posing? I, I do. And what I do mean is that the, the, the events, the facts found by the committee, his testimony that they list, his statements, and what actually happened before the court, because it's all well documented that those facts are undisputed. If there are findings by the committee in those numbered paragraphs that are ultimate facts, and I would disagree with Mr. Marx as we brief that the, an ultimate fact is intent. It can be intent. And in the cases where there's a question of credibility, when it comes down, the finest point of it is this. If a respondent is testifying to, for instance, her intent, which would actually make it from a state to a reckless dishonesty. If she's saying it was just a mistake, but the board or the court comes back and looks at all of the surrounding circumstances, then they do have de novo review. Can I ask you about this idea of ultimate fact? And let me just give you a hypothetical. Sure. Imagine that there's, there's an intentional misappropriation case. And uh, there's really no dispute that if what is said to have happened happened, it was intentional. And what happens instead is that, you know, person A comes in and says, yes, the lawyer took my money and the lawyer told me that the lawyer was taking my money on purpose. And the lawyer comes in and, you know, at the hearing committee uh, hearing says, in front of the hearing committee says, that never happened. That event never occurred. I never said those things and I never took that action. Never had the client's money. Um, and the hearing committee says, we credit, uh, pick, pick your, you know, pick, pick, uh, whoever, you know, pick your team. And the board, I mean, in, in, a, in a common sense understanding of the word ultimate, you know, the, the, if the hearing committee says, well, we believe the, uh, uh, the uh, client, uh, and therefore, we find intentional misrepresentation, and therefore, we uh, recommend disbarment. I mean, that credibility determination on a pure question of historical fact is very ultimate. I mean, it is, you know, it decides the whole case. Is that something that the board reviews de novo because it is ultimate? 
Is it something that it doesn't review de novo because it's purely historical? Uh, uh, what's your understanding of, uh, uh, more theoretically, this idea of ultimate fact and the uh, ability of the board and also this court to, to step in and, and make uh, de novo determinations in some settings? So my understanding of the definition in the, in the case Well, just, but, and let me say, I, 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 this is my own fault for asking a compound question, but can you help illustrate your theory, whatever it is, by first telling me what your answer is to my hypothetical, and then you can try to fit it into a broader theory. Yes. Um, I would say that that statement alone would be um, that just demeanor or an assessment by the committee without looking at whether there was any other evidence about that statement would not would be reviewable. It would, and, and maybe what I want to say is this, that. Well, it, it's certainly reviewable. Uh, the question is whether it's reviewable de novo or deferentially. So I'm, I'm not sure which you mean. It's reviewable de novo. It's reviewable de novo. And this is where I think, and maybe this gets right to the point. This is where I think that what the court has said is it's an alt, and this would have just what you said, it's an ultimate fact because the belief or disbelief of that statement would have a legal consequence to the to the to the respondent, right? It would have that big distinction between whether there's a violation or not. So it's an ultimate fact because it results in a legal decision about whether there was a rule violation or not. But it's, I mean, it's quite funny because you would think we would want when assessing credibility to hear the testimony and make a judgment about whether or not what he's testifying to is credible. And, and in some respects, you know, whether or not when he, you know, the four time entries where he omits the preparing his own fee, the hearing committee says, Oh, we credit him that he did more work than that. So this wasn't really a knowing uh, dishonest statement. And then the board says, well, actually we think it was. That to me looks very much like a credibility finding. And I don't know how on earth we're supposed to tell a committee that heard the live testimony that we think he's not credible when you think he is. So I wanna... It is a weird function for a, a court of appeals to sit in judgment of to second guess credibility so blanketly. So the reason that the court does have de novo review of that and what they've said before is because it's um, when a respondent is testifying and, and I think it's Ukwu that says this it's presumably self-serving like we all understand that right that that's that's sort of just the nature of the process and the hearing committee can take that into account of course and they and they did and it's not the but also the, the ultimate fact doctrine isn't limited to testimony from the respondent that might be self-serving right uh, if instead the, 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 in the ultimate question, the critical, fa purely historical factual determination was based on the testimony of, you know, uh, two competing witnesses, neither of whom was the respondent and neither of whom had any self-interest, you would, I think, uh, say that the de novo uh, principle of, uh, applies as well? Or do you think it's limited to folks who have a motive? No, but it's not limited to folks that have a motive, but it's certainly, if a if a person testifying does have a motive, requires closer scrutiny. So what the court has said, and this is what I'm, I'm trying to suggest in this case. Well, I'm, I'm puzzled because if even with people who don't have a motive, our review is supposed to be de novo, I'm not sure how much closer the scrutiny can get. Well, that, that's true, um, that's true. Can I ask you, just uh, stepping back a minute. So I, yeah. Judge Steele asked a question like this, but I also want to tap into a line of argument from your opponent. Which is, if this, if the doctrine really is that even pure questions of historical fact, if determined by a hearing committee that is making credibility determinations, if they are ultimate in the sense of critically important, dispositive to the legal issues that would have to be resolved, uh, the board is required and this court is required to review them de novo. Uh, it is uh, not our normal function and not really so much the board's normal function. And it's kind of inconsistent with the, the normal structure of things, which is credibility determinations we made by people who see live testimony and, uh, and whose job it is to make credibility determinations. And that folks who aren't seeing live testimony and who don't have jobs, which are every day, let's see you know, who to credit, will defer to them. So it's a pretty 
remarkable departure, and it sounds like a sweeping one in your view, uh, from what seem like uh, general ordinary principles of uh, fact finding and appellate adjudication. Uh, is, is there some reason why you think we should approach things so differently in the bar discipline setting? Or do you not think it's really that different from what we're doing elsewhere? Or how do you respond to that concern? First of all, if I'm, if I'm appearing to be too sweeping, that's not my intent. And I don't think that it's restricted or this analysis is any different for the disciplinary system than otherwise. What I would say is the constraint is always that the, that the credibility determination has to be based on substantial record evidence. And in the cases in the disciplinary system that I'm more familiar with that deals with this issue, when they look at the substantial record evidence, they are always looking at the totality of it and the context. So for instance, in the Baker case, if you want to go there, or I can take another example. We have- but, but Before we get to the example, sure. can I just nail you down? So that sounds an awful lot like what Mr. Marx is saying. Um, he says, you know, look, if you've got a hearing committee that says this wasn't knowing an intentional misstatement, this was just reckless. Uh, and if your position is the board reviews that for substantial record evidence, I think you two are on the same page. That doesn't, I mean, that's not what you've been saying for the first 14 minutes of your argument. So I just want to make sure that's what you intend to say. I, I intend to say just what you said, Judge Deal. So if I've said anything other than that, it was a mistake. It was, I was not, it, it was, I was not communicating it clearly. So your view is that what the board said when it said, you know, some of these violations were intentional rather than reckless, the way the hearing committee said, was that the hearing committee did not have substantial evidence in the record to find mere recklessness. It would compel the finding of no intention. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And, and, and that's what elevated. And, and I want to also just be. I guess what I, I'm, I'm just, I want to make sure because I, that's, I get that line of thought, and that's a, that's a certainly an available argument. I think it's undisputed that that argument is uh, av available. But I had thought your there was a line of argument in your brief, uh, and I thought in, again the first fourteen minutes here, which was, but the board is required, and this court is required to just review de novo determinations that are ultimate. And then there's a question of what determinations are ultimate and the like. So the board has not only the power, but the obligation, and this court has not only the power, but the obligation, I thought you were arguing, to, even if there was supported by, you know, let's say the hearing committee. Uh, so here's my hypothetical. Remember the hypothetical I gave you about misappropriation, where the respondent says never took anything. And the, the client says, took my money and said that the, my money was being taken on, on purpose. Um, imagine, that the, you know, the, the hearing committee says, we believe A. And imagine that the, the board looks at that record and says, I think there's substantial evidence to support the hearing committee's conclusion. But that's not the conclusion that I read, the members of the board collectively would reach uh, if we're deciding it's an OVA. Which way should the board uh, uh, resolve that matter? Should it do go, should it say, well, it's not what we would do, but it's what the hearing committee did and there's substantial evidence to support it, so we're deferring. Or would instead the hearing committee, say, uh, the, the board say, well, this is an ultimate issue. We have to decide it de novo. And although I could see why the hearing committee did what it did, it's not what I believe and therefore we collectively believe and therefore we're going the other way. I, I thought you were arguing for the second. Uh, sure. and, 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 and so if you're only arguing for the first, I, I misunderstood a big chunk of your brief or your argument uh, 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 this morning. This is what I would say, Judge McLeese, is that that's hypothetical. And if I understood all that you put in there, included something to the effect that there was no other evidence. So it came down to just these two competing and conflicting testimonies. And the court believed this person, not that person. We, that that's always going to be directly up to the judge if there's no other evidence there's no uh, the hearing committee i'm sorry the hearing committee and so that's going to be a credibility determination in the absence of other records that's not this case and to be clear so you're saying that and i think this is a different answer from the one you gave originally when i asked this hypothetical I'm, but i apologize if i wasn't precise i, no, I, that, I that's all right but you're, so yeah you're, and, and so but let's say i mean it's it, 
so, so just to be clear, in a hypothetical where all you have is there's like no corroborating evidence one way or another, right. it's just the word of A and the word of B. Right. Um, you would say, although it's an ultimate issue, uh, the board and the court are required to defer to the credibility determination of the hearing committee. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Now, that's a pretty uh, bizarre hypothetical because there's always some other exactly. circumstantial evidence. Right. And let's say there's a little bit, but not a lot of other evidence. And so the hearing committee says, well, you know, I've heard the testimony from the two people and there is this one piece of corroborating information. It's not that strong and, you know, it points a little bit in the way in, in favor of the client. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, my, my, I, my, my determination is, the hearing committee says collectively, our determination is uh, we're going to credit the truthfulness of what the lawyer says. Now, are you saying there's a different rule and... Uh, then it's de novo uh, uh, for the board and de novo for the Court of Appeals because there is at least some evidence other than just the, the, the testimony of the two conflicting witnesses? No, I'm saying that there has to be substantial evidence. So I can't answer that hypothetical. What I will say is that if there's substantial evidence supporting the finding of credibility. Well, the testimony, oh, you mean there has to be substantial evidence other than the credibility, the, the demeanor of the witness. I mean, generally testimony is substantial evidence. Someone comes in and says something and the fact finder believes it, that's substantial evidence. Um, so there's always, in the hypothetical, there's always substantial evidence on both sides, barring really unusual circumstances. Um, and the issue is to what extent is there corroborating information one way or another? Uh, and I'm not quite sure how substantial evidence fits into that or starts triggering a de novo obligation at some point, and if so, when. And none of that seems reflected in any of our cases about the ultimate fact doctrine, you know, that say, oh, uh, you, you know, that tie it to whether there is corroborating information or not. So I, I find myself at sea, I guess. So what I would say is in this case, and I'm going to take it back to this case, that it, the board did have substantial evidence, and it was both... It was all statements from Mr. Crane. So they had Mr. Crane's testimony in one point saying, yes, we kept records. And I'm talking about the, the Baker case. We knew we had kept records. We printed out a bill. We paid ourselves that bill. And yet when Judge Wertheim asked them to produce those records, they did not. So in that sense, Judge McLeese, supported by respondent's own testimony about his process and what he did, and supported by his own conduct in not delivering to the court what the court directly asked him to do. And in his testimony, describing his motive, that he would put his case at risk if the court found out. Now, actually, I'll take that back. What he did testify to was that that was a pre-bill and it didn't include all of the work he performed. But in other matters, in the Brown case, when he didn't turn over the time statement, what he said was, it would jeopardize my case. And in fact, this court, when they looked at the Baker case, Mr. Crane had revealed that he had spent 40 hours, approximately 40 hours on the case. The bill that he print, printed showed 43 hours on the case. And the court actually did a calculation based on Judge Wertheim's statement that his regular fee was $300 and they came out. He, if he had billed himself 40 hours at $300, we're talking a $12,000 amount of a fee based on his time. And yet he's asking for $17,000 based on a percentage. And, and Mr. Crane wants to argue in, I guess, mitigation that no guardian ever complained about his conduct. And yet the hearing committee found that not only did Mr. Crane not deliver that bill to the court, he didn't deliver it to Ms. Baker either. So if hey, you- Counsel, I, I, I don't, I'm sorry to cut you off. I know you're out of time. I have two questions I just wanna to get to before we're done. One is, if I remember correctly, in front of the, uh, the board, uh, disciplinary counsel seemed satisfied with the two year suspension as a punishment. And now before us, it's pressing disbarment. Uh, why the change of heart? Um, I would say because of, well, what we did ask for disbarment at the hearing committee and in um, consideration of the board's report and looking at it, 
Um, the, the sanction of disbarment is warranted for really three primary reasons. First of all, this court and the public can have no confidence that Mr. Crane will actually follow a court order, honestly and directly answer a court's request for information. I mean, is, is there a charge that's happened in the last 15 years? Is there a charge of dishonest conduct that's happened in 15 years? I mean, been, is there a forthcoming one that we don't know about? I couldn't disclose that if there was, but there has been no other um, charges that are public filed. That's correct. Um, but but the other thing I want to mention, which the board brought up with the disbarment sanction, is this: the detection of the misconduct would be impossible. So Mr. Marks argued that the court looked at and approved the the fee submission that he sent in. It was a it was a time statement. It was detailed, and there was no demarcation or explanation that some of the entries had been put in two, three years after the incidents had occurred. So the court would have no reason when it received that bill to scrutinize it or to ask Mr. Crane about the difference between those things. And as the hearing committee um, found and heard, Mr. Crane had in the past done that and notified a court when he was submitting a bill that had estimates. The, the other question that I just want to get to before we let you go uh, is this question of whether or not misappropriation is a strict liability offense under the rules. Um, and I guess I, I wonder what your opinion is on, you know, bar disciplinary proceedings impact some serious liberty interests. I think we've referred to them as you know, punitive, quasi-criminal. Uh, part of the reason why we impose a clear and convincing evidence standard on uh, disciplinary counsel is my understanding. And, you know, in the criminal context, when something doesn't specify a mens rea, we generally hold that it at least requires recklessness. I think that's what we said in Carroll. And here, 1.5 doesn't say what, that, there needs, that there is some mens rea requirement, but it would be a bit draconian, I think, to hold somebody strictly liable for that. And I wonder if you just have a reaction to that analogy to the criminal context that we don't, we tend not, we tend to disfavor strict liability, uh, both in the criminal context and, and in this context. Um, and just to throw out an example to make this question more convoluted, um, let's say that a staff member had in fact been doctoring the statements that they gave to Mr. Crane, so that there was some misappropriation. The trust had gone below the level that it should have, but he had no idea because he was being kept in the dark by staff. Would you still think that's misappropriation? Well, well every, um, not if it was completely unavailable to Mr. Crane in terms of knowing it, but- Okay, so it's not a strict liability offense then? It, it's a strict liability, misappropriation, the act of it is strict liability in the sense that if, if the amount in a trust account falls below what is should be held for a client. That's a misappropriation. And so the distinction I'm making is that that doesn't mean that there's automatically a sanction. I mean, these okay, are- Okay, but you, you do think it is strict liability that when the staff member steals it, that's a misappropriation. The, count, the attorney has violated 1.5, maybe in a way that shouldn't be punished. Is that your, is that your response? It, the, um, it would be sufficient to warrant docketing an investigation to determine whether the, so all right. I mean, that's that not really my that, question. Yeah. I just want to know if that's a misappropriation and I'm getting two different answers. Yes, it is a technical misappropriation. Yes, okay. yes. Um, and just to be clear, uh, uh, so no matter, uh, uh, without regard to anything that could have been done to prevent it. So uh, I'm trying to think of the most, uh, I'm trying to, a, have it be the lawyer's act rather than a staff person's act, uh, but have it be completely uh, uh, excusable in some way. Um, and so, I mean, if, if a lawyer goes into a bank and has two accounts and says, yeah, I want to draw, uh, withdraw some money from personal reasons, please withdraw it from my uh, uh, personal account. And the teller at the bank, I'm dating myself by talking about, you know, real human interactions and tellers and like, you know, just makes a mistake and contrary to the direction of the lawyer, 
takes money from a, a trust account and gives it to the lawyer and the lawyer goes off and spends it. Your view is that is misappropriation. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just taking uh, the client's money. It's true. The lawyer had no way of knowing, had no, you know, no culpability, no nothing. Um, uh, but it's a violation because there's no mens rea requirement in Rule 8.4 defining what's misconduct or in Rule 1.5 defining what's misappropriation. And the issue is only should a sanction be imposed? No, is that correct that's, or not? that's not what I'm saying, Judge McLeese. What, we're, what our position is that there has to be at least negligent misappropriation for there to be a sanction. I know, but that's not my question. So uh, it, my question is where there is, well, A, do you think in the hypothetical I gave, there is misappropriation? The lawyer goes into the bank trying to take, intending to take out uh, funds that are only the lawyers, but is erroneously given by the bank client funds and then goes and spends them. Is that misappropriation? No, not something that the lawyer would be culpable for. That's not my question. My question is, is it misappropriation? No. And why isn't it misappropriation? What is it missing? Well, I, I, uh, for, to, to fit within rule 1.5. Actually, uh, 1 I, I would th I'll withdraw that answer. Yes, it's a misappropriation, but no, we would not hold the lawyer. This is Robinson. I'm not asking. I, I, again, I'm okay. asking you. Yeah, so so step one, yeah. Okay, yeah. now step two, is it misconduct within the meaning of rule 8.4? Got it. Yes, it's misappropriation. No, it's not misconduct. And why is it not, mis why is it not misconduct if it is misappropriation and if rule 8.4 says it is misconduct for a lawyer to violate the rules? Because the rules are rules of reason. And the whole point of the misappropriation rule is to ensure the that sounds like you're walking back the idea that it's misappropriation. Okay, which feel free that's to do, but that, I, I'm just no, 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 that's not that's not because this is I don't, I don't know how to explain it. Um, we, for instance, I'm saying it's misappropriation because like Robinson, the initial conduct that caused an overdraft the court found was not negligent misappropriation, but it could ripen into misappropriation, which it did in part with Robinson, because he did not take actions that were required and reasonable to safeguard the assets. So in your hypothetical, if a lawyer goes in, directs a bank teller, take $2,000 out of my personal account, and then two weeks later, he notices he has two thousand dollars more in his account than not. I, I, I get the idea that it could ripen into okay. culpable uh, misappropriation. I'm just trying to figure out abstractly what disciplinary counsel's position is on the question of whether a you can misappropriate funds went through completely innocent acts. And I'm not sure what, I know an answer to that yet because I've I think I've heard a little bit on both sides of that topic. Well, the definition and then relatedly, b uh, is it misconduct if it is misappropriation? And then C, I get the point that it may not be culpable misconduct or punishable or sanctionable because you might think if it's totally innocent, it would be, uh, you know, uh, completely unwarranted to impose a sanction. So I'm pretty comfortable with what you think about C. I am less sure what you think about A and B. Can there be completely innocent conduct that is misappropriation within the meaning of the rule? And B, if so, is that misconduct within the meaning of rule 8.4A? And I, I just, I, I'm not sure I've gotten a consistent, clear answer. So I, I, if you want to take one more stab at uh, uh, sketching out a position, I, I would find it helpful. I, I don't want to belabor this unduly, but. Yes, it would be misappropriation if there was an, uh, an unauthorized taking of trust funds. That's, and that's and B, is it and it would it be misconduct within the meaning of rule 8.4A? No. Not at the moment that it happens, because the the there's no it's a mistake. It's a it's a understood no the difficulty that the textual problem. I mean, yeah, I get the yeah, point. Yeah. I mean, I get the point. Misconduct sounds bad, and that's the label of Rule Eight Point Four. Right. But the way Rule Eight Point Four A is worded, it says it is misconduct to violate the rules. And if you can violate the rules innocently, then it seems like unless we're going to oh. read in a mens rea requirement into rule 8.4 a which maybe we should I'm, I'm unsure um but just by the text of it it seems to say you know if the rule is a strict liability rule you can violate it by completely innocent conduct then it's misconduct to do that that's so, by its terms i 
would say that the the mens rea element of that piece is implicit in the rules in terms of mistake. So this is not limited to now implicit, it, but implicit in rule 1.15 or rule 8.4 a. This is what I'm going to say, Judge McLeese. The, the mistake idea is applied to all of the rules. What so it's not misconduct, then, are you saying, a misappropriation, if uh, uh, the lawyer walks into the bank trying to take his or her own money and ends up unknowingly through no fault of his or her own with the client's money? I, I, I'm going to say yes, only because if it's not, like that taking and that um invasion of the trust assets is a misappropriation but it may not be attributed to the respondent it may not be a rule violation or something that they would have anything to do with so just like and that's like with robinson we, i mean i, I thought part of your brief and part of the board's reasoning was this is not anything you can delegate to anybody else you're on the hook no matter who makes the mistakes but this is different. So if you want to talk about the misappropriations, Mr. Crame's status as the trustee and fiduciary, that was his only job. That, that, was, that was his fiduciary responsibility, was to ensure and safeguard the trust assets, period. And so what, what is absolutely clear is when he was preparing his fee petitions, and paying himself legal fees. He also was reviewing the entire previous year's accounts. He had access and that's what he should have done is to review them all. So this situation is not the same at all to something like what Judge McLeese was positing. Um, and, and the idea that Mr. Crane would delegate the payment of legal fees that he received once a year to a staff person at a time when he described his staff in turmoil um, and, and really fairly chaotic that he was overpressed for work. These are not the types of excuses or situations that the court found is appropriate to delegate that decision to a staff person or take instruction from them. Well, let's leave it there for now. We'll give you a few moments if you need them. Mr. Marks, let's hear from you. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I want to uh, divide my time first to address um, some of, I think, of the important concessions uh, uh, that uh, Ms. Neal made in response to the court's questions, and then to address uh, uh, what is truly the ultimate issue here in many ways is the question of sanction. Um, just very quickly on, on this uh, discussion of misappropriation, uh, I, um, I think we've briefed it. Uh, uh, I would also ask the court to look at the, I think, the very compelling uh, Mika's brief by Ms. Cotton filed on behalf of a number of DC bar members. There is no evidence of negligence here. Uh, the standard that the board created was created out of whole cloth, a standard that you have to go back and review a year's worth of, of checking statements. Uh, that if you don't do that, that that violates some standard of care. Well, Mr. Marsh, you said there's no evidence of negligence. I mean, yes. that uh, it's the childish tendency I have when someone says there's no evidence of X, my reaction is, well, challenge accepted. There's probably some. So here's, if you know, if, if the way you are going to compensate yourself, you think it's right, you later learn it's not right. The way you're going to compensate yourself is you are going to take money out at the front end and you're going to notify the court that you're doing it, but not accept permission. Well, it's pretty predictable that you're going to at some point get permission from the court. And if you haven't set up a system to avoid double payment, uh, it's a natural thing that'll happen, which is you took the money out the front end. And then there are people who are getting these orders where say it's fine to take money out at the back end. And that doesn't seem like a very good system. If you're going to take money out at the front end and then also, you know, have some filings with the court about it all, you would think you'd want to have uh, some procedures in place to avoid double payment. Um, and one could say it's negligent not to have them. Why is that not? some evidence of negligence. Um, I, 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 I accept the uh, assertion that it may, be, it's an argument, but here's why I think it's not uh, 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 evidence that, that rises to the level of negligence. First of all, uh, there's no charge of inadequate systems. There was no charge This is that, that, that his systems were well, not- I don't know that, 
So I'm, you mean uh, if the question is he misappropriated and it was negligent, you think there has to be a separate charge that his records were wrong for the, the, the considerations like the ones we were discussing to be relevant as evidence of negligence? No, I, 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 I don't want to press that far, uh, but it was never, there was, it was not an issue uh, pressed, discussed, or, or, or where there's any standard of, of care. There's no expert evidence. There's no, there's no evidence of, of, of what the reasonable practice is of trustees in the District of Columbia, even today. But remember, this is 20 years ago. Okay, these special needs trusts were new. And if you're going to find negligence, particularly by clear and convincing, which is the standard, there's got to be evidence of what the standard of care is, what's reasonable for a lawyer in that position. And I don't think the, the, the board or the court, I, I'm not in a position to say, I think that's a, that, that, that if in a, in a civil case, you would not let that get to the jury without- I, 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 I will say that that CA trust, if, if I'm remembering right, I think it was a 2002 disbursements to himself, sort of the one page ledger of disbursements, it's not, there's not a lot, uh, three of them in that year are to himself. You can look at that real quick and say, probably shouldn't have three disbursements to myself well, in, in a trust account where I'm paying myself annually. But but actually, he then that he he corrected he, one, he, and he you might think one. that you'd go go check out the other one too. Well, but 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 your honor, and I think we point this out in the brief. Uh, the other one was like the first day of of right. 2000. I think it was January second. So I mean, yeah. I, I get your point. And so, but and, I mean, don't you want to go back and look at two thousand one just to make sure you didn't do the same thing that you just did in two thousand and two? Well, I um I, I don't know the answer, but that but the point is that was already done. In other words, the, the charge was not detection to detect. The charge was he did it in the first place. So what, the, what's different about a special needs trust in terms of the duty? Uh, uh, your fiduciary duty. You, you made the point that special needs trusts uh, were not a known thing uh, 20 years ago or, or just coming on the scene 20 years ago. Well, what's different about being the, the uh, fiduciary of a special needs trust? Uh, Your Honor, I've never been the trustee of a special needs trust or any other trust. So I, uh, I, I don't know that I can answer the question uh, uh, on the fly. Uh, I'm not sure there is, but I, I, again, I just feel not comfortable since I've never been in that position. Is that fair? All right. I, I just w wasn't sure I got no. your point when you yeah, said no, I, I, I was a bangled thing. Right. It, no, I, 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 in mind, at least. Yeah. Right. I, it's a fair point. Um, could I, because I know the course time limit, could I turn to a couple of other points? Yeah, please do. Thank you. So first, um, uh, uh, I, uh, I think the concession that uh, um, Ms. Neal made is really important here. Okay. Uh, I understand the debate about whether it is or isn't a violation of Rule uh, 1.5, but uh, 1.15. But um, uh, she said specifically there uh, there has to be at least negligent for a sanction, uh, and the standard again is clear and convincing evidence. I think at best you've got an equipoise situation here with respect to negligence, uh, and as the, this court said in, in Romansky, uh, and I'm going to come back to Romansky in a second, which is to, because it's a very important case on the ultimate uh, fact issue. Uh, uh, Judge Kramer said in Romansky, um, equipoise is not clear and convincing. We cannot, we won't find culpability when there's just equipoise. Uh, that is not clear and convincing. I wanna turn to the, um, uh, again, the really core question of what's an ultimate fact and what deference is required. Um, uh, it is clearly between whether conduct is negligent or reckless is an ultimate fact, because that's not a question of state of mind. The question of something, whether something is intentional or reckless or intentional or negligence is driven by state of mind. And the Romansky case is squarely on point. Squarely on point. In fact, if I may read to the court, in that case, the court said, we are not prepared to decide whether bar counsel met the standard of showing knowing, no, knowing uh, there was knowing premium billing, excess billing, as a matter of law from the cold record before us. And we therefore remand to the board. Okay, it's for the trier of fact to decide whether something is knowing versus reckless. Uh, so I think Ms. Neal's statement that to, to conflate the ne negligent or negligent reckless dichotomy from an intentional 
uh, a negligent or intentional reckless dichotomy is completely at odds uh, with this court's well-established principles. And again, we think that it was, there's no basis uh, for the, uh, the board, nor do we think the court should second guess uh, the very explicit findings of credibility uh, and finding and rejection of all the claims of dishonesty. So I'd like to turn uh, uh, to the issue of sanctions. Um, of course, what drives the question of sanctions is a question of, of proportionality and consistency. Uh, uh, this course jurisprudence is full of cases of much more pervasive, sadly, <laughs> as a member of the bar, it's sad, but many cases of much more pervasive, systematic, uh, ongoing dishonesty uh, uh, in statements to, to, to clients, in statements to the hearing committee, in statements to disciplinary counsel. Um, uh, whatever is charged uh, against Mr. Kramer does not equate. Look, at the, uh, just recently, the case, it, we talked about the, the Tun case, the Tun case. Uh, it was a one-year suspension, a much, much more uh, uh, egregious dishonesty. The recent case of Inray Anthony, again, a one-year suspension. Um, uh, Inray Martin, uh, which was a really, really uh, 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 false testimony to the hearing committee, false statement on bar application, protracted misconduct, <clears throat> 18 months. Um, uh, the, the, the court's well familiar with that case law. We've, we've highlighted in our brief. Um, <clears throat> at, most, at most, a modest sanction might be warranted in this case because of the nature of the and the limited scope of the violations that even the board found. But a couple of things I want to emphasize why at most. First of all, there are no aggravating circumstances here. As the court's questions uh, 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 elucidated, there's been no, this is 15 years ago. There's been no no record of any misconduct, disobedience of court orders, and the record is very full of. I mean, look, it, it was it was uh, 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 it was a moment in time. Uh, Mr. Crane uh, sincerely regrets that he was on this crusade. Uh, he and his counsel were, were pressing hard, but as the as the uh, even the dissenting uh, uh, member of the hearing committee said, he was doing this not just on his own behalf because he genuinely believed it and that he was trying to establish a rule for all other trustees. That was the finding of the dissenting member of the hearing committee. Mr. Crane fully cooperated with the investigation. Uh, uh, he, he, there's been, uh, um, he has a, a really exceptional record of service. Um, um, he's expressed remorse. All the factors this court considers in mitigation are here. Uh, I submit probably uh, more compelling than any case you've seen. And it would be a significant disservice to his loyal and longstanding clients. You'll see the, the brief of the amicus that shows uh, just a strong support. Uh, they want his expertise. Uh, he fills an important role in uh, providing services to underserved, disabled, and elderly populations in our community. The purpose of discipline is not to punish. It's to serve the public and professional interest. Mr. Crane has already served by virtue of the operation of bar rule 11, section nine. And because the board made a really an unwarranted uh, recommendation of disbarment, he's already served over 20 months suspension. I respectfully submit if this were coming to the court with, with anything other than, with, with not a uh, excessive suspension uh, requirement, there's no world in which this court, I believe, would, would, would uh, support a 20 month suspension. Obviously that's for the court to decide, but I respectfully submit 20 months would be highly disproportionate uh, to uh, other cases. It would be inconsistent with this court's jurisprudence. So he's already served a suspension far longer than warranted. So I would end by asking, uh, I think, I know it's extraordinary, but I would uh, respectfully submit that uh, this court should promptly terminate the current suspension so the passage of time, as the court considers this case and prepares its opinion, does not have the inadvertent effect of imposing on Mr. Crane further unwarranted period of suspension. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marks. We have your arguments. And Ms. Neal, uh, did you have more you wanted to add? Yes, thank you. I just want to um, speak to the sanction. There are aggravating circumstances and probably one of the most compelling is that the you know, beneficiaries as the court knows of these trusts were severely disabled children 
that in pursuing his crusade, at every turn, Mr. Crane chose his personal interest in pursuing and advancing his position or his financial interest adverse to the these vulnerable beneficiaries. Um, and so uh, in terms of the sanction for the other reasons I've mentioned, the deterrence, um, the difficulty detection, the flagrant dishonesty found by the board, and looking at Cuber Bascom and Henry Paul House, that disbarment is the appropriate sanction given the misconduct um, and rule violations that were found. And finally, as to the request um, that a suspension be terminated immediately, as Mr. Crane testified at the hearing, he serves as a trustee. He doesn't need to be a lawyer to be a trustee. There's no indication that it has restricted or limited his practice as a trustee or fiduciary. Um, and we would ask the court, in fact, not to do or consider that, and rather um, it, to any extent that um, there's a sanction imposed that would um, disbar or uh, impose a further suspension that Mr. Crane be required to notify the courts that are supervising his role as a fiduciary of the, of the um, court's decision. Um, but with that, I thank you, and I have nothing to do unless there's a question. Thank you, Ms. Neal. Thank you to both counsel. Uh, the case was well argued and it's now submitted. Um, and uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, Your Honor. This court is now adjourned.